Sure. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the June 4th Hanford Advisory Board COE meeting. My name is Lindsay Summers, and I'm the DDFO for the Hanford site. Mm -hmm. I just have a few reminders for everyone before we get started. The first one will be conducted in accordance with the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. And the second one is each member has a joint responsibility for assuring that operating ground rules are observed and discussions are conducted in a respectful manner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear Administrator Adams, this meeting is being recorded for real time. <laughs> and if you, have, if you just joined us, we could always sign in sheet at the front of the room alongside the handouts. And for those online, those same handouts can be found online. And the link I will put in chat in just a moment. And before we start looking at agenda review, there are a few unfamiliar faces to our new note paper. I'd like to go around the room and do a couple introductions. That's okay, with everyone. I can start. My name is Josh Catnott, facilitation team. Uh, Chen Flores, facilitation team. Rob Davis, tank waste. I'm, I'm Tracy Arnold. I'm the committee chair. Lindsay Summers, COE. Hello, Cecilia, we're in the Department of Energy. Susan Coleman, public at large. We have our camper challenge. Larry Brand, public at large. Chris Sutton, public at large. Brian Miller, ecology. <laughs> and yeah, Zoom. You know, they want to introduce you. Oh, hello. Darren <laughs> Cowley with HMIS, and I was downstairs, so my apology. <laughs> <laughs> and just a couple people online. Uh, we've got Dan. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, Dan Zulich, a uh, member of the public. Good morning. Dana McFadden with ecology. Chrissy, what are we looking at today? Well, let's look at the agenda. We've got upcoming TPA public involvement activities, followed by a regional meeting outreach discussion with a break, and then we'll go into the 2023 TPA public involvement survey results, followed by issue manager team of three parts discussion, and then going into committee business. So first off is that the upcoming TPA public involvement activities um, Josh, do you know the lead on that one? I think we'll probably start with Dana. With Dana. Okay. Yes, yes I'm, I'm happy to start. First of all, thank you very much for allowing us to be here. Um, I just passed out the uh, TP uh, Public Involvement Opportunities webpage, which you can always find on hanford.gov. And you'll see that we have the holistic agreement uh, comment period that launched on May 30th. All of the um, materials about the proposed change package for both the TPA and the consent decree went out on April 29th. I'm sure you, I know you're preparing advice and you've probably been carefully looking at the proposed changes. And then I know Ecology has uh, launched IDF and has a couple of other comment periods. So, yeah. Dana, I'll kick it over to you to talk about our comment periods if you want to. Yeah, the um, IDF. Uh, integrated disposal facility agency initiated uh, comment period started yesterday. Um, it goes until July 19th. All the documents for review are online. This is wrapping up um, an appeal from 2023 um, that we were working with through with uh, DOE. So this wraps it all up and we'll get that permit modification finalized and out the door. That's the only one we've got at the moment. Then Ryan, did you want to make any other remarks about? Yeah, sure. So yeah, so a couple of components. The, well, first, um, I'm gonna talk about Ida. Since I, I realized I talked about Ida a little bit yesterday, Dana covered a little bit about that there was an appeal. So yeah, last year there was an appeal we worked through with energy. And then, so this is kind of wrapping everything up. Like Dana said, uh, and there's two parts to the settlement agreement for the, the comment period. One is, um, you know, just talking about a shower that's going to be installed during certain activities at IDEF. Then the other components talking about the permit modification for the comment period, just trying to provide the crash course level about what the comment period's about. Since I know that's, that's um, rather than just say there's a comment period happening. Uh, and then for holistic negotiations, uh, like Dana said, that started off on May 30th. Uh, and there will be some hybrid public meetings in Richland, Olympia, Hood River, July 9th, 10th, and 11th. 
And uh, we did receive, we've already received, you know, last week we got some comment period extension requests. And so we got those, I think, first batch of them like late after Thursday afternoon. So the agencies are going to be meeting to discuss those those extension requests. And um, yeah, so I don't have a lot to share on that right now because we haven't had a chance to actually meet and discuss that we're going to be, uh, you know, evaluating the, the the extension requests and and then taking, you know, um, action appropriately when we have a chance to talk about it some more and figure out that whole thing. That, that's all I uh, wanted to share as well. There was one other small piece, and I know that CAB members are already pouring over the proposed changes to the TPA and the consent decree, but I just thought I would um, make the addition that it's, it's a, a subtle difference, but we're hoping that the comments could come in tailored to the proposed changes. Um, it's, I think, uh, worth noting that really the holistic agreement is now for public comment. It's the two groupings of proposed changes that are out for public comment. And so the more focused and tailored the comments can be, that will help us better respond to what the public wants and help us produce a higher quality response to comments documents. And Ryan, did you have any other thoughts to add to that? I don't think so, other than, um, you know, if there's any specific feedback folks want to share today, I know we're going to have a conversation about like regional public meetings. I think that's geared more towards the September HAB meeting, but happy to take any, any feedback anybody has. Um, and I'm, I'm listening to any feedback. You have a question. I have a question new, new to public comment process. Um, the extension requests for the holistics mm -hmm. is re request for to be to be applied to only the organizations that requested an extension, or is it to everybody? That's a good question. Yeah. So if we're going to grant an ex a comment period extension, it would apply to everybody, like a, a, just a general comment period extension. So if we if we were it wouldn't be extended to certain parties, it'd be extended to everybody and anybody. Thank you. Yes, and that triggered a thought of mine as well. Um, we are one hand for it and have it's a Hanford site or, and sometimes we get a request from HAB to extend a comment period until HAB has had time to submit its advice during your regular schedule. But as always, I just wanted to reiterate that we can always end the comment period and Lindsay and Marianne and Laura, everyone, they do a great job of keeping everyone informed from here to headquarters that the Hanford board is writing advice. And of course, then there's a response to that advice and that's given, you know, premium consideration. And so you can always go ahead and conclude a comment period, start working on the response to comments and go with that. And so, and that's nothing normal, irregular that we haven't said before that you can conclude the comment periods knowing they have advice is is coming and then the response to comments document is handled in a way that comments are being put together, but then of course that gets its own, you know, direct response to your advice. And Brian, did you have any other any other item to add further to that? I don't think so, other than I'm just interested, especially today, I think, uh between the CUE committee and the tanks committee to see if there's an interest in the advice. And I think that you know Lindsay, Roberto, and I have worked together to help support any kind of advice development the board wants to do. I don't know, Lindsay, have any thoughts on that? I know that we talked a little bit about if the board were to pursue any advice. I know there's some tight timelines, but I think that we want to try and work to be flexible as the board does want to work on holistic negotiations advice. Yeah, we're flexible to support that advice development process. So, so I'm just, I know that uh, we just did the presentation at the last full board meeting, and, and today was probably be the chance for board members to talk more in depth about things, I think, between open board and stuff. So just interested to see if you guys want to pursue anything. Any thoughts or perspectives on what we've heard? I just have a question. Um, it's my understanding that the advice is, or not advice, the comments are submitted through Ecology's portal. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you can submit comments a few different ways. Ecology is taking comments because we have our, our e-comment system where you can actually go through the portal, like you said, and submit comments. Uh, or you can send them in mail um, or email. So there's a couple different options for, for folks that are interested, but primarily. We could send them through email? Um, I think so. Dana, we can we take comments through email too, right? Yes, if you send them through the Hanford at ecy.wa.gov 
Yes, we, we accept them that way too. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the preferred method's the, the portal, but we'll take them multiple ways. Okay. Always good to uh, clarify too that at these upcoming three public meetings, comments won't be accepted at those meetings verbally. All the comments need to be submitted in writing through ecology. Well, will there be a box and some cards so people can write out a comment and put it in the box? No, we've never done that. I found the document particularly difficult to read. Seems like a bunch of lawyers wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that scared me is when every line is numbered. You know, and it's like, oh. And so, and I also find that I don't have a lot of knowledge on the past holistic agreement. <laughs> and so I don't know exactly what's really changed. Though I am very positive about the highlighted bullets that they did present to us as being uh, an important part of the negotiations. So, but I found it very difficult to read. It should be a committee of the whole item too, I, I suspect. <clears throat> Pending the extension request, so if they are not approved, when would the common period end? Um, the common period is currently scheduled to go till August 2nd, so roughly 60 days accounting for holidays. And as uh, David Enid had pointed out to us in an earlier event, all the materials went out April 29th. And so that really makes it that the materials kind of, even though the, the opportunity to submit a comment wasn't open until May 30th, the materials were out for a view for a total of 90 days with the August 2nd. Looking at pad logistics, if, if we were going to try to get advice done, uh, We'd have to start the IM team today, get it approved in August through the committee meetings, and then September's board meeting will be the first opportunity to pass it. So, something to think about. <clears throat> Any questions, thoughts? Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that with us yeah, and Dana. Um, we're well ahead of the agenda. Would you like to move ahead to the next slide? Sure. Uh, the next uh, agenda item is regional meeting outreach. And the next have meeting in September will be held in Spokane. So um, let's discuss uh, how TPA agencies can conduct outreach for that meeting. Does anyone have any ideas? Well, spokesman review, I mean, that's a daily. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the first one I can think of. Most read newspaper there. I don't think the Chronicle exists anymore. Maybe a week. Um, a lot of radio stations have event calendars type thing that we could put in for. We, we have a uh, Tri-Cities Business Review. Business journals are equivalent to Spokane. That's a good question. You can find out. Mm -hmm. Here's a question for Amber. Yeah, I asked Amber, um, but so she suggested advertising in daily and weekly newspapers um, and getting earned media stories on public radio, radio or with TV media, but not. A ton of specifics, like names of things. Yeah, I think for the Yakima board meeting last year, we did a short news release that shared the the have meeting coming up, and I shared with some specific media down there. So I'm sure we could do some similar this go around. And um, we have our Eastern Regional Office based at Spokane, so I could touch base with them on specific media contacts. They um, work a lot with that. It could be helpful to get some direct earned media. I think. And if I remember correctly, didn't Ginger reach out to some of the universities around there as well, just to let them know about the meeting? I think so. Okay. I'm just trying to remember. <laughs> so maybe that's another opportunity. Yeah, some educational outreach. Does Spokane have an equivalent to Tridec? We work through. They've got to be, especially a city that big. 
imagine they have some score or something like that. Right. <laughs> and Spokane tried it. Yep. For social media, Ryan, do you ever like boost posts, like pay for? We do. So we've, uh, uh, there's a whole story that I'm not going to get into the background, but essentially I kind of started the process for our agency because it wasn't started for a while, but we've, we've done a few hampered ads for like our Let's Talk About Hampered events and specific to TPA stuff. We did a paid advertisement for the Hampered Dialogue event last year. Um, on social media so that was on facebook and instagram um so it's something we can look into those go around because um, you know so you would know about like targeting you can like choose yeah, yeah. you're sharing yeah because you could you could target it specifically to you know spokane like the bubble around spokane and maybe some surrounding areas because that's what we did for hanford dialogue we we targeted specifically um you know some different areas around there and same for our let's talk about hanford's when we did social media ads for those we targeted like uh like seattle olympia portland hood river richland spokane those kind of areas so there's some specific targeting you can do on social media so yeah. that's something we could look into and maybe a follow-up once we have a, a final agenda to say not only are we going to be in the track in in spokane but this is what we're going to be talking about um, so people are just saying what's the have yeah, because it's going to want to come in for specific topics. Exactly. Agendas drop around, it's not pointless. Exactly. And I think Amber was talking, um, I know she gave some ideas to facilitation, I think, right? But uh, that she's that she was interested in maybe connecting with some of the elected officials and inviting them to the HAB or to however the structure of the meeting is to have some kind of component where they could bring those those kind of audiences over. Um, that's an idea Amber had raised when I talked to her a few months ago. Well, she also suggested, and we kind of talked about it at the SC, I mean, maybe he's kind of going back, going to an evening component, you know, starting late and, and doing, basically, we do have business in the afternoon and then go to an evening component with those meeting topics that the people that are working during the day have <laughs> then stop on the way home from work and listen in. Um, I think that um, one of the concerns that spoken acts would have um, was, you know, all these um, rumors and innuendos of how hazardous and how dangerous and radiation, all this scare has really percolated through the average people that aren't paying attention. And certainly, I think our topics for that meeting, or even the evening meeting, ought to be, you know, why are we not afraid of him? Meaning that what is going on there that's not so good and how we're we protecting people. Um, just a thought in, in that is that that would be what people would come to the meeting for, I would think. Before we talk about like logistics of the meeting, can we talk about the other question on the agenda, which is what can have members do to support regional public outreach for the have September meeting? Well, I, I, my point was the have a good topic. But what else? What else can you guys do? So we all belong to civic organizations, and uh, there'd be an opportunity to get a uh, and advertisement in a newsletter or something of that sort for civic um, local newspapers outside of, of Spokane usually take announcements free. And there's weekly papers also that a lot of people read and they're the free ones that are in stands um, outside of restaurants and stuff. Those take about a month to um, to get something published, but but announcements are free in those as well. I know we've mentioned Facebook and Instagram. How about TikTok, which is a younger generation that accesses it? Like, I don't, I'm not on it. But I was like, see, we're gonna make some TikToks new yeah. <laughs> because I have never, I just. So, so I don't even do Instagram. I do Facebook. That's it. Sorry, uh, that's the limit of my um, interest. But face. But as we, uh, one of the gentlemen that was at the um, chairs meeting, is a historian, and he he's younger, 
And he commented about how the younger generation, I'm not going to define that, um, but is heavily into following TikTok. And so I that's an opportunity. I don't know who has access. Um, is there still a federal prohibition on? Yeah, I just was received a notification we cannot use TikTok, yeah. but that's a good idea. The state has one. Uh, we've used it for been drawing it. Uh, we've done one hand for TikTok, and that was me doing uh, talking about the beer reactor. Uh, but we also we, what we have also done is you can actually put those videos and you can also come on other platforms like we uh, duplicated it put on Instagram too. Um, yeah, I know you guys are growing your stuff. You guys have TikTok yet? We don't. <laughs> no, that's I I'm the one that does most of the social media, and that's just out of my realm. <laughs> <laughs> I do not see the viral hand dance, but. <laughs> You're <Right. first>. yeah. <laughs> so what kind of viewership do you have on your TikTok site? It's 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 I think it's still one of our smaller platforms. It's still maybe that's something we should talk about at a at a seaweed meeting at some point. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's just an aside. Uh it's more of our smaller audiences because we just got it like a year or two ago, but it's been growing. Um uh, I I have to go pull up to see what specifics we have on it, but we get kind of decent viewership, especially for the for the viewers we get. But I know the hampered one I made got um, a decent amount of interest on both Instagram and on TikTok, and I got some good engagement comments and stuff. And uh, uh, it was funny, Susan Luckband actually commented on, on the Instagram version, so I didn't know she had Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's it's growing. Um, we've been doing some posts on there. We actually have a, a digital content manager at the headquarters that kind of takes the lead lead on our, our main accounts, but I work with them on posts that go to our, our main channels, not our Android channels. <clears throat> So it's an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, it's an opportunity for sure. At least until the government bans it. Okay. For real. <laughs> yep. So Mia, you're pretty active on posting about the regional meetings, and that's yeah. something that could be done maybe um, again, and maybe others could either share postings or help advertise the meetings. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know a member of our have team has some family members in Spokane and they're talking it up and you know, I don't want to give my personal information, but uh, so they're talking to their family and saying, hey, you know, tell your friends, we're going to be there. I know Amber said she's going to be here today, but I think she's probably from the have has got one of the best Spokane connections because she lives yeah. and works in Spokane. Uh, so I'm sure she could connect us with a lot of, do help, do help with some of the outreach and stuff up there since she's probably the best have member for Spokane, I think, unless there's another have member that lives there that I'm forgetting. <laughs> Any other opportunities you want to think of? Put yourself in their shoes. What would make you come to this meeting? What would make you commit two or three hours or a day or whatever to a meeting? It's the subject. We got to listen. And kids. But then? And how stress falls. <laughs> Speaking of that, I just had a story about my wife. She's been, we both retired, she's been trying to work out all the time. So she started this new class. It's kind of a step kind of class or whatever. They have this thing called the stress ball, which is like a leather ball that basketball players used it. But you're supposed to take this stress ball. And can you imagine? 20 ladies in a room all smashing these stress balls down as hard as they can and hopefully saying a name at the same time. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, uh, who did you use? Well, you, of course. <laughs> but anyway, just a... Well, one piece I had um, that you had... Uh, you know, some of you are parts of civic groups and stuff, and I know sometimes there's some connections between like Rotaries, Kiwanis, and other groups between cities. Um, so if any of you are part of those groups um, and have like contact information that we could like share like a news release or announcement information to, that'd be super helpful for the agencies to get if anybody has like helpful contacts that you could send our way. I want to pick up on Ross stating. If you were in Spokane, to be part of life, what would, what would motivate you to go to a hand meeting? What, what do you have concerns? Do you want curiosity? Um, something you've never heard of before? Oh, 
deep fears. Yeah, we gotta ask good subjects. Well, I think when when the PSC was throwing out ideas for agenda items, that that was sort of on our mind when we were, you know, thinking about how maybe the presentations aren't site specific focus because that's important, but we want to also honor where we are and try to get uh, regional engagement, right? I don't know that I agree with that. I feel like the purpose of the board is to provide that <laughs> advice to the tri-party agencies. And so I'm not sure that the purpose of us bringing briefings to, I guess, the group in a different region would be to cater to the public, it would essentially be to allow the, the board to do business, but at the same time, you know, make sure that we have the opportunity to share our agency updates mm -hmm. with the community that may not hear them every day. But, it, but it's agency updates plus because mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to do a little bit of stuff that's of interest to them to get them in the door. Correct. So I think that we had talked about potentially a PFAS briefing because that is something that's really important to um, <clears throat> the members of Spokane. So it is something that would be consistent with um, mm -hmm. the Hanford site. But at the same time, we just have to remember that the purpose is. Yeah, it's still happening. Yeah, yeah that's still something I'd offer some friendly pushback on too is that, you know, we're not going to go to Spokane to present on a PFAS site in Spokane when right. that's another one of my programs that I'm not a part of that that's kind of their responsibility for that kind of stuff. I think like Lindsay said, it'd be, if it, especially if it's, a, if it's a topic that's a bit of interest to Spokane, which I hear you know, PFAS is one that I think the, the idea that was thrown out was like EPA doing like a, cause it's, it's a topic that happens I've heard about before. So you kind of need a basic understanding of the topic before you can get into the nitty gritty. So I think the idea was, you know, like a PFAS 101 followed by DOE presenting on uh, PFAS at Hanford specifically, and I think that kind of an example would be more appropriate. Absolutely. I just want to be careful that we're not you know, presenting on non-Hanford yeah, topics. And, and yeah. I wasn't talking about non, non hanford topics, but I think the, the ones that we threw out were, were PFAS and then um, the transportation. transportation as part of TBI, which is going through Spokane, right. and right. then exactly. maybe National Park Service doing a talk on the Green Run, which came yeah. back to Spokane. So those were the, like, it's Hanford related, but it's also got an like total extra for them. Yeah, I hear you. And I think that, you know, the September meeting is going to be a very robust meeting. I mean, we have lots coming forward, potentially two pieces of advice, the agenda, or I'm sorry, the work plan and the calendar for FY25. So um, that should be the focus, right, is for the have to conduct their have business and to accomplish the goals. Now, with that being said, we'll also have our TKA agency updates. And I would guess maybe space for one more topic. But Outside of that, I, I don't think that there's going to be the time allotted, especially if we're going to do an evening session day one mm -hmm. and then another session on day two. I just don't think it's feasible to. Uh, yeah, all those I, items. I, I think you're right in that it has to be limited, but I would like to highlight our successes. I, I, I think Matt Irwin is a great presenter and, you know, he could talk about DF Law coming online. That, that's a big success. We've got people that can talk about pump and treat, where we're actually removing the radiation from the groundwater. Um, that's a success. Um, so to me, I don't want to talk about problems. I want to talk about successes. Understood. So as far as logistics go, I heard the desire for an evening component on day one, correct? And so the last board meeting I had, I don't know if it was at the board meeting or at the follow up ESC that I had heard that folks wanted to start earlier day one to then end a little bit earlier on day two. Is that this still the same request that you have for Spokane? I believe so. Yeah. Well, well, the, the, the idea that we were pushing around was that the folks who are coming from the public to the evening session. You aren't necessarily going to want to sit through our, us talking to the work plan and advice. So if we started just after lunch and had our introduction of advice and the work plan and all the have business, mm -hmm. then take a break and then have the evening session, which is the agency updates and presentations, and then finish up the second day with adoption. So like this, yeah, four business. Yeah, and I, I, 
Sorry, yeah, go ahead. I do want to say, um, I know in the past when we, I think we did this once before an evening meeting, mm -hmm. we did start the second day a little later. Okay. Um, because of the evening meeting ahead. So in that case, I think we need to not start earlier as was requested for this specific one. I understood. Okay. Um, I'm just remembering. Yeah, yeah. And, and then um, the last evening component one we had here was, I think it was October of 2022 or 2023. That's where we did the starting about one o'clock, did board business in the afternoon. When the evening session came, we did agency updates, the discussion, and then we did a, the second kind of uh, more interesting topic, I guess, which at that time was the agreed order for leaking tanks, I believe. So okay. I think that's the idea that I'm hearing is that the evening component would be like TP agency updates and PFAS or whatever the other topic is. And then day two would be adoption of the advice and calendar. And I mean, and, and unless it happens the first, unless it happens the first day, or we could also throw in like the green one on the second day. <coughs> and one topic of presentation of interest. But we did the agency updates and did PFAS on day one, evening of day one, and we did like. Green run on day two. And you could incorporate the TBI and the agency updates because that is part of Yeah. And as far as selected topics, we haven't started to work through that yet. And so um, I was just using PFAS as, as an example, but I don't have an answer yet. So we're going to start working on a lot of this stuff after the completion of the committee week. Mm -hmm. So for those who are planning this outreach and those who experienced it last year, are there any particular gaps we want to address by this committee? I think for me, it's just really ensuring that we have a robust outreach, both by the agencies as well as by our members as well, just because we want to make sure we are effectively utilizing taxpayer dollars. And so if we're all traveling to Spokane, we want to try to have the, the biggest turnout we can. And so how we how we can do that um, when we can start. So I I would anticipate that as soon as we have an agenda drafted, we're going to try to start with advertisement. And I think one of the important parts of having you know possible public turnout to a meeting is to have good board member turnout to a meeting. So mm -hmm. that's something we might be able to socialize amongst the have and I'll all talk to have members, but have members to talk long have members and other folks to talk to other folks to try and. Make sure you've got the dates booked and you can be there if you, if you can in person. That way we can try and have as much of a board member turn as we can because why would the member of the public come to a meeting if only like 10 hasn't for show up in person? Um, just, just something that we all about. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point because that's a bit of a concern in the past. Is that was a good turnout at the other regional meetings. That being said, I come from a place where I'm not going to be in the meeting because I'm going to be out of country, but I will have staff that will be there though. So. <laughs> Hey, Dan, do you have, do you have thoughts to share? Oh, uh, yes. The, uh, how much of this is going to be taking place at the Davenport Hotel? The entire meeting will be at the Davenport Centennial. Well, that's a wonderful building, and I think we kind of ought to make that a little bit of a star in the background as, as a draw. I mean, I've traveled up there just to go to the Davenport Hotel. My wife spent some time there as a child, and it's, it's quite a delightful building. So I think... Kind of use that the background as a draw. Yeah, because yeah. that stuff, a lot of those things are. <laughs> Thank you. Any other recommendation? So it, it might be worth contacting um, television stations there, and perhaps one of them would would come out and, and do a you know a ten or twenty second interview or at least announcement that that the the Hanford meeting is occurring, and that would occur probably the day of or the day before. They wouldn't really do anything outside of that. But sometimes they're desperate for news, and they and it's possible that uh, <clears throat> that uh, they would do something with us or uh, uh, shoot some video during the, during the sessions. Actually, that that's a great idea because a lot of the local at least here in the Tri Cities, I know the local news stations always will are open to filling, um, doing fillers. It's almost always in the day. mornings, early in the mornings, and they'll do interviews. They'll do page thing. They'll put on you know filler commercials, plugs for different things. 
if it occurred, somebody would have to step up and, and be the interviewee. Uh, you know, but I think they're Susan. Jack, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we did last year, we didn't actually get any media that picked up for the broadcast last year, but I think that's some push more this year. But last year, just what we did for the news release was uh, worked with you know, uh, Jeff Wilford's UE and then uh, Roberto for the agency side, but then we also looped in Susan. And I think we had the, uh, Tracy and Michelle, we just looped in the news release because we had a quote from Susan in the news release last year that we did. So yeah, I envision, especially if there's like a request for an interview or something, obviously one of the agencies could do it, but I think it'd be appropriate for like the have chair, vice chair to, to, to do like a little news bit too. That way the, you know, the have's pro and the have too, in that sense. So it could be multiple different ways to- You, to, you certainly to, wouldn't to, get a two and a half minute segment of somebody's news in the morning or evening but but a little piece would be that it would be mostly um shot video with a little audio supporting them yes about a month ago amber uh on behalf of the columbia river keepers sponsored a speaker uh and i don't know if anybody listened in on this or whether they even knew about it but the talk was called half with the most dangerous place on the united states and <clears throat> The guy actually wrote a book on it. The book's out somewhere. But she sent out notices to this talk all over the place, all over Washington, Idaho. And it might be worth Brian contacting Amber and getting that list of people she sent out notices of that speaker to and have her send notices on the HAB meeting out to all those people that, that, that she sent about the speaker. The other thing that would be interesting is how many people from Spokane listen to that talk? If she comes back and says two people listen to that talk, something called Hanford, the most dangerous place in the United States, then how many of those people are going to listen to a HAB meeting? So I think there's two things. One, potential audience from the people that she sent out notices to on that speaker. Two, how many people from Spokane actually listen? And that was Simone. Amber works for, or is board member of part of American Northwest, not Columbia Riverkeeper. Okay, American Northwest. No, no, you're right with Columbia Riverkeeper, but not the, Simone is the, oh, not Amber. is the one that did the interview. Okay, with. Simone. I think that's a, it kind of goes back to what Lindsay was also requesting earlier about what HAB members could do. So, you know, these HAB members have constituencies that have some email distribution that could have members up in the Spokane area. So if HAB members could you know, share the, you know, information about the HAB meeting to their constituencies, through their channels, and, you know, the agencies will do our channels, that way we just try and reach as many people as we can. I think that'd be a good, good way to help tackle it, try and reach as many Spokane, Spokane, Spokaneites as we can. Spokane. Absolutely. And I can't speak for Ryan, but for the department, what a successful HAB meeting looks like for us is to have an engaged board there um, working, getting that advice adapted, getting all of those items completed, um, so I think that regardless of the public turnout, it's going to be a very successful meeting. A lot of work to be done. Any other thoughts to share? Do you have suggestions? Logistically, though, if you're if we're doing the afternoon followed by an evening session, we should make sure that we leave enough time for people to get. Uh, presenters and staff members. The agency has gotten all the input they were hoping for out of this. You think so? Yeah, I got some really good feedback. Thank you, everybody. I, I always enjoy these, these roundtable discussions. They're super helpful. Well, we are very well ahead of the agenda. How would you like to proceed? <laughs> Would we like to have or is everybody ready for a break? Should we just keep moving? Should we just keep moving? Yeah, let's keep going. Let's do it. Okay. Um, so we're moving ahead to the TPA public involvement survey results. Are you ready to speak on that, Ryan? Yeah, let me let me pull up.
some validators at a page for it. Okay, so I think I came to the committee earlier this year to talk about last year's survey, uh, survey results. And so now we're kind of getting back to do pattern of, so we just did this year's survey, or sorry, 2023 survey was done in January and February roughly, and then we published this report uh, in April. So I think now that we're kind of getting back in the habit of sharing these with the committee, as long as the committee is interested in it, I'd love to come back probably maybe about this time every year, that way we're doing it consistently and talking about it. Um, so if you go on our webpage, uh, if you could just go to ecology.wa.gov slash Hansberg for short, you can see our big bar here on the side. You can just go over into our public education tab. And then we have a whole section that talks about the surveys, which is right here, actually, sorry. Um, so we have all of our, uh, either all of our, the majority of our past surveys all the way back to at least 2012 that you can go and look at for the reports. And then we have our most recent one sitting up here. So I'll click on that. Um, the packet that the folks in the room have today is kind of a, a, a bit of a hybrid version because this year's report was really long. It was like 40 something pages, and that's because we included all of the results for the English, uh, the English version of the survey and the Spanish version of the survey in the report. And that makes up the vast majority of the pages. So to save some trees, uh, what you have printed in front of you today is the is kind of the, the content version of the report and then the quick highlights version of the sum of the uh, of, of the results, so it's kind of a kind of a quicker, more concise kind of version. Um, so before I go to the report, I'm just going to scroll down to the results, and we can talk through the results. So I'm gonna avert your eyes if you want to get too busy. Okay. Um, but actually, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you guys the interactive version instead. So I'm going to that. Um, so if you go on the report, there's this kind of this link you can click that shows you a bit of an interactive version where you can see specific numbers and stuff. So that's the version I'm showing um, right now. So uh, this year's this year's survey, as I shared in previous HAB meeting, we had a total of 226 responses. You'll see here that it says only 221 because this quick summary looks at just the English version. Uh, the report, um, when we did the report summary, we combined the English and Spanish versions together, but uh, uh, largely, when you add in the other six responses, it doesn't change a whole lot. So we'll just talk about just the just version. Um, so one of the first questions that we had that we asked was, where do you look first for information about Hanford cleanup? And uh, you'll see by the variety of options we talked about, you know, the agencies, news organizations, social media, stakeholder organizations, or non-government, you know, um, groups, word of mouth or other. And this year's biggest response came from the stakeholder organization category, followed by news organizations, and then um, a colleague of energy and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so really, really, again, really, really good responses, because I'll also reiterate that last year's survey had a total of, uh, I think, 87 responses. And so we saw a really big increase this year, which is really awesome. And I think something that was helpful was I think some groups on the board shared the survey to their constituencies, which helped increase um, responses. So thank you to everybody that shared the survey. It was super, super helpful to, to help get additional responses. Um, the second question we asked was, how do you prefer to receive information about the Hanford site? And you could choose all that applied here. Um, the biggest answer people had was uh, email distribution list, which 164 respondents said they like getting um, information that way. And then uh, the other ones were all a little, uh, quite a bit lower. Um, the next top options were mass media, so like you no know, radio, TV, newspapers, uh, in-person meetings or events, and then um, searching for information online or there for uh, how they prefer to receive information. Uh, this one, we use the Likert scale, so it's uh, for the following statements. Please select the option that you agree most with. I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, so we had um, five different statements. One said uh, public notices, fact sheets, and publications are easy to understand. Websites are easy to navigate. Website content is easy, easy to understand. Social media posts are engaging and easy to understand. And I believe my input helps influence Hanford decisions. So these results are uh, uh, relatively similar to last year, where the top four answers um, were were kind of just pretty even, um, slightly more uh, again various, but they were largely kind of even keeled. And then the last one, I believe my input helps influence Hanford decisions, was a lot more folks. Uh, strongly disagreed, uh, disagreed or neutral in this category. Um, and we'll talk about uh, some of the report a little bit later. So I'm just going through the, the results right now. So there's that that's where th those pieces all came in. 
Uh, we asked a couple free response survey questions. One was, how can the tri-party agencies improve website or social media content? We had 134 responses to this question. Uh, question five was, please share specific examples and ideas of how you think public information and involvement can be improved. Out of the uh, 221 respondents on the English version, we had 220 responses here, which is fantastic. Um, and then the sixth question that was for your response was, if you don't usually pay attention to Hanford issues, why? Um, and so if you go to the actual report, which I'll open again real quick, you can actually see every single written response in the report, which is, this is also why it's so long, because we had 200 you know, plus responses on, on some of these. So you can actually go through and read the responses. Uh, for the sake of time, it would take us quite a long time to go through all of them. I'll let you guys look, do that on your own time if you want. We can talk a little bit at a high level about what we're doing with these, but um, to want you to know that these are there. You can read through every single response. Uh, we even just pasted them in as they were written. That way we weren't like changing anything. So you'll see some answers that there's like an NA or like emojis and stuff. So just one, uh, you might see some weird stuff in there, but that's just because we were pasting things in directly to make sure, you know, that we weren't like editing content out. Um, so after those uh, uh, optional written responses, we had um, the survey kind of geared more towards uh, meetings. And so we, there was a, a survey skip logic that if you answered no to the question, if you attended a meeting, it just skipped you to the demographics question because it doesn't make a lot of sense for you to answer questions about if you attended a meeting, if you didn't attend the meeting. Uh, so we asked, uh, the first question we asked was, do you prefer to attend meetings online or in person? This wasn't the skip question. Uh, but a vast majority said they could not vast majority, 63% said they preferred online, um, and then 21% said in person, and then 16% uh, indicated no preference. Um, and then this question eight was a question that, that diverted you to the demographics if you said no. And that question was, did you attend any public meetings for the Hanford site in 2023? Um, of the respondents that answered this question, 167 said no. So 76% did not attend a public meeting for the Hanford site. And 24% uh, said yes. So of that 24% that answered yes, that they were taken to the next series of questions about public meetings. So we have another Likert scale, which asked a couple uh, statements of speakers were clear, coherent, and easy to follow. Quality of the Q&A session was good. Quality of meeting facilitation was good. And overall, you can see these categories that, that people largely thought uh, either uh, strongly agreed, agreed, uh, or were neutral that they thought that all of these things were, were good or coherent, easy to follow, which was some pretty good feedback. So it kind of goes to show overall our public meetings, um, uh, folks think the Q&A session facilitation and the speakers were, were, were um, pretty sufficient. Question 10, did you provide public comment after attending the meeting? And we worded this very specifically because there were no public meetings in 2023 that had a public comment component during the meeting except for HAP meetings. So you'll see that there's a question here that says, uh, I provided comment during the meeting only applies to Hanford Advisory Board meeting. Um, this is a lot easier to read on the actual survey, but uh, so um, did you provide public comment after attending the meeting? Um, you know, 14 said yes, uh, 32 said no, and then eight just said that they were at a HAP meeting and provided comment during the public comment session of the HAP meeting. Question 11, did you provide the agencies following the meeting, or did you provide feedback to the agencies following the meeting using the online evaluation form? Seven said yes, 18 said no, and 29 said, I did not realize there was an evaluation form. So that's something that, that we're taking back that I know there's some meetings that, for example, I know DOE's got some evaluation forms you guys use for your meetings. We had one for the Hanford Dialogue meeting, but there's clearly room where we can you know, make it clear that there's an opportunity for feedback to be provided because you know, about half the survey respondents didn't know there was even an opportunity for it. So that's room for growth, I think. Question 12, were reasonable accommodations available at the meeting, such as language translation or disability access? 13 said yes, 9 said no, and 32 said not applicable. Uh, this is another uh, kind of learning curve for the next year's survey was uh, for those that said no, we didn't have a follow-up question that asked uh, which accommodations weren't available. So in future surveys, we're going to ask a bit of a sub-question beneath this that says something to the effect of, you know, if you answer no to the above question, you know, we'd like to hear what accommodations weren't provided at the meeting. That way we can you know, know what accommodations were provided and do our best to make sure that those are available in the future. Um, and then we had a couple free responses for this set, uh, one free response for this, uh, the public meetings um, portion of the survey, which was, do you have any feedback or recommendations best based on your experience at the meetings you attended? We had 29 responses to that question. And again, you can see all of the specific results on the, uh, uh, on the, the report on our website. 
We also had, uh, what is your zip code? So of the 221 English respondents, we had 212 respondents that provided the answer of where their zip code is. And I'll go back to the uh, results real quick to show you guys the map that shows kind of where everybody answered the survey for us. Let me just zoom down here a little bit. Okay, here we go. So this is coming from the question of what is your zip code? So uh, Dana put together this graphic that kind of showed where people answered from. So we had some people answer down in California, Texas, uh, over on the East Coast. Um, obviously, a vast majority of respondents came from uh, Washington and Oregon. So um, the, the we got the most responses from the west side of the state and then Tri-Cities kind of region and then over in the Portland, um, Oregon area. Uh, and then some other areas scattered throughout Washington. Um, there was one respondent to the survey that uh, was, was kind of interesting. The zip code came from like a Navy ship off the coast or something like that, we think. So, <laughs> so somebody on a, like a military ship answered the survey. Uh, so we don't have that highlighted on this map because we don't, we don't know where that ship was at. Uh, so we had that, which is kind of funny. Um, and then going to demographics, we asked, you know, what is your age? And a majority of respondents uh, were 65 or older. The next closest was 55 to 64. And then it just kind of sloped downwards from there. We didn't have anybody on um, um, the 18 to 24 category. Uh, what is your highest level of education? We had a uh, uh, majority said graduate degree or four year degree. We had some respondents that answered, you know, two year uh, doctoral, some college. Um, you know, apprentice, apprenticeships, trade school, or certificate program. And then we had uh, just a few responses that said high school or uh, GED. Um, the next question was indicating race or ethnicity. The vast, vast majority of this year's survey respondents answered uh, white Anglo. The rest, you know, were kind of uh, spattered, um, but all relatively low. Uh, the next question was, please indicate your household income range. And this one was a little more, a little more varied, but the, the biggest answers came between fifty thousand to one hundred and fifty thousand income. Um, so one of the biggest things that we've been trying to do with our survey the last few years has been trying to reach, you know, audiences we haven't reached before. Is, you know, particularly, you know, um, for ecology, you know, folks that we want to hear more from are, are you know, uh, historically overburdened in underserved communities and and. I think we're, we're we're getting a little more responses that way, but obviously this year's survey results indicate that we're still kind of reaching the same people we have been, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. We really want to hear from those people, but we also want to hear from people that we historically haven't been reaching. So that's that's going to be a continued area of emphasis to try and reach people that don't know a lot about Hanford, so we we can you know figure out how to better reach them. Um, so that's kind of the, the the quick notes version of the survey results. Uh, if you go through the report here, again, you can go through all of the English results uh, specifically that we just walked through, um, the Spanish results. And then um, another thing that's new on this report that I wanted to highlight for everybody was on page, um, it's on the second page. This is a new addition that we had. It's called the 2023 Public Involvement Activity Summary. So under the Hanford Public Involvement Plan, we realized there was one component that we weren't doing that we should be doing, which was including a bit of a public involvement summary that, uh, so we decided to include that with this report. And this summary just highlights the public involvement activities that TPA agencies conducted um, the previous calendar year. So we, we talk about what activities were conducted by the TPA agencies. So we had our Hanford Dialogue event. Uh, we talk about all of the comment periods that uh, Ecology held, which are listed here. And then we talk about EPA's comment periods that they held, and then Energy's public meetings, feedback, and comment periods, which you can see again highlighted here. Um, so obviously, you know, Ecology didn't hold any specific public meetings for um, public comment periods. So we don't list those here, but uh, for next year's survey report, we'll obviously put like the test bed initiative and stuff like that in there. But um, and then we did include some links on where you can see more information about uh, all these comment period opportunities. So we included links to Energy Ecology and EPA's websites. But I just want to make sure I highlighted this addition to the report so people can see what was all conducted uh, in the calendar year for public involvement. Um, with the caveat being that this list does not include Hanford Advisory Board meetings, and it also doesn't include um, like Speakers Bureau or like education events. So like when uh, the USDV staff go and do, um, you know, speaking events at like Kiwanis, that kind of stuff, civic organizations, the same for ecology when we go to schools and we present civic groups, uh, that list is not um, uh, included with this. This is just kind of strictly public involvement and like comment periods, that kind of stuff. Uh, but if you read the report, uh, we kind of just highlight overall who we distributed it to. 
Um, we talk about, uh, again, we kind of summarize the results that I just went through, so I won't spend too much time on that. And then we have one section on the report that we talk about some lessons learned. So some of the big lessons learned uh, this year that we that we documented as TPA agencies was that the agencies need to further engage a broader audience as the population strength and hampered site grows and diversifies, which I talked a little bit about, about trying to reach new audiences. Uh, we did say that you know, we brought in distribution of the survey this year, so we were successful in increasing the total number of responses from 89 to 225. Um, however, the demographics reached similar demographics to those in the past, so we're going to continue to seek more diverse audiences and increase participation. I'll say from my side, when I was doing outreach for this survey, I actually touched base with I, I did uh, some distributions to like you know, local city groups, those sorts of things that connected with communication staff from you know the local cities, for example. Um, the Tri-City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce did a distribution on their email list. Uh, uh, the city of Pasco made a social media post on their, their, their Facebook page after I connected with them, and I think Richland did too. So um, I'm looking to build, continue to build those relationships next year as we do outreach for next year's survey. So I did, I think that was a really great, at least starting point where I was able to connect with some folks that we didn't connect with before to share the results. Um, survey results indicate the respondents for online meetings and that the quality of our meetings improved those in the past. So that was just, you know, kind of a really good lesson learned that, that, uh, that, you know, that we, when we're doing public meetings that, you know, when possible, we want to try and include a hybrid component, especially for those that can't make it person, they can join online at least. And that the quality of our meetings has again improved from those in the past. So looking to build on that momentum. Um, survey results this year indicated majority of respondents didn't need any accommodations. However, this is where I just said that, however, there were some that said that reasonable accommodations weren't available at meetings. So we're going to include a follow-up question next year. That way we can see what accommodations were provided and try and improve on that. Um, and again, uh, uh, here we highlighted, while there's a lot of interest to Hanford locally, many of this year's survey respondents were from Oregon and the west side of Washington, including, uh, so roughly the rough percentages is, that is about half of the survey respondents came from the western side of, of the mountains. 34% uh, came from this side of the state, 14% were from Oregon, then 3% came from the rest of the United States, and then off on a boat somewhere. Uh, and then we had some planned actions as TP agencies that we wanted to, to highlight as part of the report. So we're going to continue to look for ways to improve our website, social media channels to provide up-to-date, accurate information to the public. Um, and the last year, uh, we did want to highlight this is that, and, and DOE has presented this at previous CV meetings, but that DOE, you know, they did do a really big website revamp in the last year. Uh, we're in the process of updating the ecology website to refresh it and, and try to expand some of our, hunt, our Hanford content. Um, looking to provide published content that's more accessible, readable, and understandable, including, you know, so we're hoping that, you know, these materials that will continue to improve them so they have sufficient background information, graphics, plain language, you know, alternative text for accessibility, photo captions, other accessible features. You know, one component of this is there's various, you know, laws that require accessibility, and, and that's at least a huge emphasis for the state that, that documents are accessible, you know, have they have alt text and, and other components that make the documents accessible. So that, that's a pretty big focus that we that we have at least. And the uh, DOE and EPA have similar requirements and, and uh, emphasis with their materials. Uh, the agencies will work to seek suggestions and discussion on future public involvement activities from the Hamburg Advisory Board and other groups. So, you know, you know we've been having some roundtables, um, you know, like today we talked about regional outreach, and so we're looking to build on that and, and you know, connect with you guys and get your feedback on public involvement activities. Um, the TP agencies will work to evaluate methods for reaching more media outlets, organizations, community groups. We will discuss the feasibility of holding more general public meetings in more locations. So, you know, looking to build upon you know, the Hanford Dialogue event that we held last year, which is our first kind of big TPA general Hanford event we've held since before the pandemic. So we're really looking forward to, to holding more of those kind of opportunities in the future. Um, and we will work to better communicate how public input can influence decision making, because as you saw in the survey results, um, I'll, I'll highlight it again, is that a majority of respondents said that uh, you know, they strongly disagreed, disagreed, or were neutral on the statement that they believe their input helps influence Hanford decision making. So we want to work better to explain the public input process of public meetings and want to work more broadly to share, you know, uh, recently developed publications that explain the public comment process, provide tips for, for providing more effective comments. So really trying to highlight how your feedback um, you know, can help influence Hanford decision making. So that, that's an emphasis that we want to try and, and help um, help people understand that their input is really valuable and, and, and that we that we take it seriously. 
And then the last point here was the agencies will, will work to continue to expand outreach and education efforts to more segments of the community to help improve understanding and build interest in hamper cleanup. Um, one other point I wanted to highlight was, again, this is the TPA summary report. Each of the three agencies um, is also looking at you know, the results individually to see if there's any specific actions or improvements that we want to take you know, individually as agencies um, in, in addition to the TPA actions. So uh, speaking for ecology, you know, we're looking, this is where we're looking specifically at some of the written feedback that was in the three responses to see if there's any uh, you know, really great ideas for improving some of our web content or our future public development opportunities. So, so there's a that kind of separate action that the agencies are looking at these individually to see feedback or um, results from the survey that we could that we could take individually as agencies in addition to what we can take you know collectively as the TPA agencies so uh, kind of um, I think that's everything I kind of had for the results this year so open to answering any questions uh, after uh, after Dana if you have any thoughts um, uh, on the day we are thank you thank you and I don't I think we have anybody the humor too what was that? I appreciate the humor too about the leadership. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Josh, we don't have any media, do we? Yeah, same DPA is available. All yep, that's, that's what I figured. So, uh, uh, um, so you're free, obviously, feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions. But um, but again, I also want to uh, send my thanks to, to the DOE and EPA staff that you know, Ecology conducts the survey on behalf of the agencies, but you know, the agencies have worked together on developing the survey and working on the, the report for the survey and those planned actions. So it's it's a really good collaborative TPA effort. I just want to make sure I highlight that that while we conduct the survey on behalf of the agencies, it's really a group effort. So so thanks to Dana and Jen and Roberto and everybody for working with us on it. I forgot Susan, Mia, Charles. Okay, so your um your interest local interest breakdown. Should we look at using that as part of the discussion for where to do our regional meeting next year? You mean the, the map that should visit? Yeah, kind of well, the 48% Western Washington, so we go away. 34% Eastern Washington, 14% Oregon, 3% the rest of the United States. Um, I mean, we, have, we haven't had interest data to factor in to that decision making. Um, it might be a good data point. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's a it's a good data point to look at, you know, potential areas where we could hold public involvement or have or something like that. So, you know, like you said, it that that just shows, you know, who from who responded to the survey and where they're from. Like you said, uh, uh, about forty eight percent were from the we call it the Greater Seattle area because it's scattered throughout a wide variety of zip codes over there. That's why we kind of have just a big general bubble. That yeah, so generally the West Side had about forty eight percent, and then about 39 percent from. Tri Cities region and then and then down to Oregon too for, for the next biggest chunk. Yeah. I have multiple questions. Yes. Can you scroll to number 10, please? Yeah. Totally. Question number 10. This one? Um yeah. Is this so the question is word is I'm just curious. So you have public hearings. You're not asking about a public hearing, though. You're asking if people submitted in writing a public comment after attending a public meeting. Yeah, so I think that's why we that's it's this is a word a bit weird because we didn't hold any public hearings in 2023, so right. there was there was no opportunity to provide comment at a meeting. So I think the idea here was was uh, asking if they provide a public comment after attending a meeting. It might be helpful to say like written public comment or okay, because I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how I answered this one, but <laughs> reading it now, it seems a little confusing. Okay, so specify the wording a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unless there's hearings held this year, and then you'd have to do a, a separate question about that. Like, did you give comment during a hearing or, um, yeah. And I was curious about, um, so the, the list of like uh, how you, the efforts to increase survey responses. Yeah. Um, DOE isn't listed on the list of like outreach. I'm just curious if DOE did social media outreach um, on like the survey. Was it promoted? Well, what we do with the surveys is <clears throat> they used to be printed. And then when you came in and signed in, you had the option to fill out the survey and leave it with us at the end of the meeting. And during COVID, we transitioned that totally to electronic. So when you're participating in the meeting, you've got the um, survey results that 
when a person is concluding the meeting, it's dropped in the chat, and then people fill it out and send it back in that way. And so that's how we've done it for all the meetings. But we have we do always provide a survey opportunity at every public house. And Mia, were you talking? Yeah, I think I think Mia was talking about the the public involvement um, survey when the survey went out. If DUE shared the the survey to like social or anything like that. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. I apologize. That's okay. Yes. So you did so share it via like your social media channels. Yes, yes. Ecology built it, and then uh, DOE shared it. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's something we can go back and look at, see if we missed. Um, I think it just makes it se seem like it was really one-sided of like ecology doing a ton of, of sharing, boosting, paying for outreach about the survey. And then I don't see anything from DOE of like what their efforts were. Yeah, I think part of part of the, the component here is, is um, like I said, ecology conducts the survey on behalf of the agencies because both EPA and DOE have some kind of Rules and restrictions on survey stuff. So I think you'll see here that there's there's a sub bullet here that says that you know EPA region ten account shared several of Ecology's posts. So they shared our posts, but they didn't make like a post themselves. Okay. And I think when we looked at the past posts, we looked at who shared it. And we saw EPA and saw EPA on there, but we didn't see energy, which is why I think we didn't put energy on here. But Facebook is weird sometimes, so so it's not, we probably missed it. So I think I think we might have um, shared some of our posts. But like I said, they have some some they have some different weird things that kind of. They have some extra hoops they have to jump through. So I think that's the reason why they didn't like EPA and DUE didn't like share organic posts themselves. They just shared our posts that went out. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes right. That's, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. For that's helpful to know. Yeah, and I think that's another reason why why we kind of took up took over the some of the effort too of sharing it. Um obviously I know energy shared with some other folks outside of this, but that's why we still send it out through our distribution channel. We still send it the Hamford info list, but that's why we do a lot of the, the actual kind of advertisement and sharing for it is, is some of the restrictions EPA and DOE has. Okay, that's understandable. Um, the other thing was, I'm wondering how different this is gonna look um, next, like seeing this come next year, just because of how many more public meetings are gonna happen this year. There were only three last year, like official, not just have or you know um, what you were explaining about rotaries and things like that, but uh, there were only three official public meetings last year. So um, you know you see the list of comment periods, which some of them are incredibly inaccessible, and having that opportunity to actually go to a meeting, um, I think makes a difference in in outreach um, and getting the the public involved. So you know I'm really curious to see how this is going to change come next year. With holistic negotiations, traveling, um, reaching different you know regions of the, the the two states. Yeah, I think they'll be really interesting too because I think you're right. Last year, uh, the only public meetings that, again that were listed on here was came in the form of the Hanford Dialogue meeting and then Energy's uh, five year plan meeting, Clean Priorities meeting, and um, I think it was just those three, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, you're right. The next year, we're obviously we're going to have the TBI public meeting we held already this year, the Clean Priorities meeting that Energy holds every year, um, the five-year plan. But then in addition to that, too, like you said, so we have TBI, we're going to have the, the um, holistic negotiations um, meetings in July, and then, uh, and then and you know, hopefully when nine, exactly, whenever that time happens. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna do a lot of meetings for that one too. So yes. it's and then obviously we hold any TPA events. So I, I'm interested to see that too. That's a, that's a really good feedback there too. Yeah. One point um to add to this conversation is back in, I believe it was the 2021-2022 time frame, and of course there's a survey to review. We had an all-time Hanford record number of comment periods. We ran about 20 in the first time. And so that way you can see. Uh, a, a block of time where we had a, an enormous number of comment periods and a block of time where it scaled back and then this one moved forward. So you'll have a few years there to look at the expansion and contraction of yeah. uh, large numbers and small numbers. Do you agree, Ryan? Yeah, I think, um, I think you're right. It's like two or three years ago. I, I, I think I remember one of those years um, and, and Dana could probably speak to it too since we have to put all of them all on our website, but if you actually go to our webpage too, um, one thing that you can actually see uh, coming to that point real quick. So, so related, but not related, um, just to answer your questions. If you go to our public comment periods page, you can actually scroll down to beneath current and beneath closed. So this is closed for just this year. 
Um, and then we actually list some items that have our historical closed comment periods. We only go back a few years, but uh, up on our website archive, we, these actually go back to like 2017, I think 2016. So you can actually open it and see all of the comment periods that were held. And whenever energy holds a comment period, we actually uh, also do our best posts on our website. So to my knowledge, uh, all of the comment periods the agencies held, if not all of them, at least the majority of them are on this web page. So we have just a brief summary. So you can actually scroll down and see all the comment periods that were held. You know, this example is 2021. Um, so you can see there's quite a bit of comment periods for this year, um, which I think Dan was kind of getting at. And then um, 2022 is what you were just also talking about. I think 2022 might have had even more. Yeah. Yeah. See, 2022 was a, was a bit of a, another busy year <laughs> so sometimes some years they expand some years they contract yeah i think this year yeah i think this year what you're looking at um, we've only had a couple comment periods this year it's been pretty slow for comment periods this year that being said some of our comment periods are a lot larger this year for example tbi was a pretty big comment period and holistics is a huge comment period rev9 will be a massive comment period so while we have some fewer comment periods this year the scope of them is also quite a bit bigger so <laughs> But it's definitely an interesting point to, to like Dan said, you look back on previous years to kind of see um, kind of the scope of stuff. Um, One last question. Yeah. Um, so under your, your section where you're talking about, um, you know, the, the survey response that says uh, people didn't feel that their um, comments were, uh, I can't remember the wording. Yeah. Um, it didn't make a difference or... Uh, with, yeah, I believe my input tells me I'm the same Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, so for the kind of you, you're the agencies reflecting back on what to do with that information. Um, I think one of the things that that um, people may be looking for is like how, like um, examples, like, and I can think of I think the decontamination showers for IDF. I think those came from public comments. If I'm not mistaken, of um, people commented saying we think you should include decontamination showers in the IDF permit modification, and then Ecology actually took that information. Um, if I'm understanding it correctly, and is now incorporating it into the the permit mod. I, I think I think you might be right because I think there were some comments about it. I think Ecology had had some concerns off on it too, but I think you're right. There were some specific comments about it too. So like those tangible examples of like you wrote this, we took that information and we we used it. We incorporated it into the the permit or into the whatever document it is. Is like that's what may would make me personally feel like oh gosh. There, influencing decisions um so that's just one feedback um, oh, that's good feedback thank like you. ways to to make people feel like yeah absolutely yeah that's something that we want to you know we want folks to to engage and provide comments and feel like they're being heard so you know um we're looking at ways to do that that's some really good Thank you. Exactly. Everyone, I mean, everyone's very passionate about this. We all love this work, love to do it. And if nobody comes and comments, then, you know, it's an abject failure. Yeah. Where else? Well, I, I just had two questions that we were listening to this. Uh, uh, I, when I take a survey, I think we're sending, we're sending a survey to a sampling frame, what the people chose uh, didn't respond rate. Uh, so many people, some percentage of the re people mail the survey respond. So there's a non-response rate. Uh, does that concept apply in this particular survey? I think yes and no. I, I think we're trying to reach as many people as we can. So I guess you could hypothetically say the non-response rate is like the rest of Tri-Cities and Washington that didn't answer, but also you know, not everybody even saw the, the distribution. So I'm sure we have some kind of, we, at least I know for like the, the Hanford Info distribution list for our email distribution list, that we've got the number of folks that we send that to. Um, and then I, I can't speak to the audiences that share the survey in other channels, but it adds up to quite a bit. So it's, yeah, that, I don't think that's something we're super factoring right now, because we're just trying to get as many responses as we can, but um, that's an interesting question though. Okay. Uh, I need to read, read the thing. That's different questions. So um, you mentioned that a lot of people didn't know that there was a 
comment form on presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any uh, way that just add a QR code to a slide deck and say so questions and fill out our uh, form at the end? I think so. I think that's something that we'll look at doing is including a bit of a link to it. And I think that, that Energy's done that some other stuff before. I want to speak to you guys. Yeah. You guys have done that. I think we we have had a QR code that as you're walking in and out, right. you can put your phone up to and scan to the survey. Yeah. And and I, so I think we want to make sure we have that for our upcoming three roadshow meetings. Yeah, and one, and one piece. Yeah, and one additional. The one additional piece of feedback we heard was this, uh, with, and, uh, from a conversation at the HAB actually was uh, after the Hamper Dialogue event because what we had done at that event was I had a, our our you know a college tab that had the survey that people could respond to and then nobody answered it because they were all in a rush to get out at the end of the night. But I think um, in addition to having like a QR digital version, I think for the people that are in person at an event, having like an actual physical survey that could fill out would also be helpful for the folks that prefer to fill out that way too. So I think there's a couple different things we're looking at doing to, to help increase the knowledge of the surveys existing. Um, but yeah, I think that's something we can look at doing a little bit more is, is you know, maybe make an explicit QR code or link on the end of the presentation and the facilitator making a more um, re-emphasizing that we'd love to hear from them and, and that that way they at least know it exists. Yeah, if there's a, a fact sheet or something for you know, the handout, um, you know, people can say, oh, yeah, I forgot to do that, and then come back to it later and say, and go. But if they also get handed a copy when they check in. Right. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Then, you know, get hard copy. They can write notes as they're going. Um, and those that don't have a phone that is QR code capable. Yeah. Right. Because handing out a survey with, like, the like the agenda or the presentation copy or something like that. Yeah, that's a good one. I like the idea. So, um, <clears throat> The top here it says uh, 95 minutes to fill out this survey. Um, I think this is skewed because some people like just left the survey open. Uh, and so if you get somebody that sits on the survey for like a week, it's probably going to skew it a little bit. So I think I think before that happened, when the survey results started coming in, it was vastly, vastly shorter. It was like a couple minutes. So I, okay. I think this is just skewed from, this is one of the things that forms doesn't do really great. <laughs> I, think, I think it took me three days to finish my <laughs> <laughs> Right, exactly. So the other thing that um, comes to mind here, and and I, we might have alluded to it a little bit, but um, I, I really see this as being some information that Susan and Maya could take to the SSAB meeting um, and and I also would, you know, if DOE can't do surveys and they don't have an agency equivalent to ecology, maybe there's another way. But it would be we've got what seven SSAB teams out there, and we ought to be able to compare this. I mean, DOE ought to say, "Gee whiz, is this thing working or not?" And and. And add some standardization to our SSABs um, and, and see what their people say. But and correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, this survey wasn't directed towards the SSAB. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. I understand. So are you that. asking to do like a, a look like an SSAB survey here? And no, then no, no, no. What, I, what I'm I saying I'm is, is this is valuable information. And Susan and Maya can take it to the sure. SSAB meeting and explain this is what we're doing and this is where we're at. And and then possibly they may say, oh yeah, let's do this too. Let's figure out what we're doing right and wrong, and get comments and et cetera. If if they're SSABs, they're all getting comments. I mean, they have provisions. So do other SSABs do anything like this? I think. Yeah, I, I don't think so. So they probably should be. Well, it's not the SSAB doing this. It's it's right. the agencies. So yeah. do, does does the other offices do the other offices do surveys like this? It's part of the their SSAB. Yeah, it's exactly. part of the public involvement, public outreach program. Yeah, yeah and there's a specific, uh, and that's that's something that might be interesting to look at too, because you know we have the tri-party agreement here, which is which is pretty unique, and we've got the Hanford Public Development Plan, which is a requirement of the tri-party agreement, and a requirement of the public development plan is the survey, um, and. And then there's their, their public bulk plan, plan says ecology and conducts the survey on behalf of agencies or something to that effect. So right. I, I, I'm interested here too at some point. Might be worth for me looking up to see if the other sites do something similar. But just like you said, if the sites, if DUV's got just these general kind of um, 
uh, restrictions or extra steps to hop through. Uh, you know, how, how do other sites yeah. Um, yeah. measure effectiveness of, of public involvement? I yeah, think that's what you're right. asking. Right. Yeah, I, yeah. I would think that <clears throat> the folks on the SSAB, your board, um, would um, really appreciate understanding this information and how to reach their people. Just by 95 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Other thoughts, feedback, questions? Well, um, as we continue to, uh, and if there are any other comments, I could talk about it, but I just want to highlight if there's any specific feedback on the survey, if you have any suggestions for uh, you know, maybe a question we missed. Uh, obviously, we talked about some questions we definitely missed, but if you think of any just suggestions or feedback on the survey, please reach out to me, um, and we're happy to, because we're not going to start putting together the draft of next year's survey until, like, the fall time frame. Um, so if you have any feedback before then, feel free to come over and, and share anything you've got with me. We're happy to, to consider it. And, and I think we took a few of the comments when we were developing the last one before the last go around. So um, super valuable feedback that we do. We do listen to you. Uh, another example, your, your input helps. So. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and one of the highlight I didn't highlight was for the actual survey out of the um, out of the 18 questions, you were only required to respond to, I think, two or three of them. So you could you, the people could pick and choose if they if they didn't have a lot of time or they didn't feel comfortable answering a question. There's only like two or three in there that they were required to answer. Okay. Seeing any other comments, feedback, questions? Okay. We're ready for a break. Okay. All right. So just waiting for where we are. I think we'll come back at 10.4. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. 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 10.39. I think we're close enough to start at any point. Um, next item is a report back from the CUE's issue <laughs> manager. Tom, are you ready to take a lead on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, for those of you who weren't at the meeting a couple meetings ago when we started the IM team, um, it was just a, a way to, to lump some sort of related topics together. Um, and the summary of just the three different parts of the IM team one was the easy part, um, which you have in front of you. Um, which is some draft advice that um, came out of the IM team related to um, comma periods. Uh, I'll talk to that in a little bit, but first I just want to give an overview of the three different parts. The second was a review of all of the past CAB advice um, related to public engagement and outreach, um, which uh, Mia will talk to uh, put together sort of a reading list. We haven't sort of tried to synthesize those and see if there's anything that any clearing things that need to be addressed still. Um, and the third, which um, I'm hoping to have a conversation here about, is the idea of a Stanford University, um, sort of a compilation of all of the different presentations that have presented, like 100 level, how to, what, what is uh, CERCLA, what is RECRA, and uh, so we can have sort of a, a watch list for folks as they're coming onto the board to get up to speed. Um, and not have to redo the same talk every four years to, um, you know, have the new class um, get up to speed. Okay, so those are the three parts. Um, the first part was uh, this advice that you have in front of you. Um, and the idea here is uh, the TPA public engagement plan. Um, and CERCLA and RECRA and Ecology's permits all have required permits, and those permit periods have a set of uh, comment periods, not permit periods, have a set sort of response metric. So, um, in like a record of decision, they will take all of the comments and do um, at, at the end, they'll sort of summarize them all and then respond to them, right? Um, ecology, I think, lists every comment exactly as it comes in with the response um, often um, for theirs. Um, so, but there's also the, uh, the TPA agencies have taken the step uh, to try to get engagement. 
for stuff like cleanup priorities or the life cycles uh, scope and schedule report, which has no requirement for response. Um, so um, I feel like that could be what is in that survey we saw more than 50% of people say that they don't think that their comments are heard or make uh, impact decisions. And it could be that the majority of comments are on the cleanup priorities and they never hear back that that comment has been received or heard. Um, so the idea for finding advice is even when there's not a requirement, you know, it would be best practice to publish the comments that come in. So there's a record of, uh, yes, my comment was received and uh, you can see what other people are saying. Um, and then if, if there's time and energy to maybe uh, make some response or even just a broad statement that says, we received all these comments, we appreciate them and we submitted them with the, the budget request. Um, so that's really what this advice is. Um, and uh, if we wanna go through and Warren Smith or questions on sort of if you hate it and you don't want it to uh, even be considered, then that's what we're talking about too. But um, so I guess first step is to open it up and say, is there anything someone absolutely cannot live with on this advice? Is there anything that needs clarification or typos? Because I tend to have those. Would this also apply to public comments provided during meetings, like our public comment period during the have meetings? Mm -hmm. You mean the verbal comments? Mm -hmm. The official public, they go on record. Um, so it is requirement of FACA to have it, but. Those already have a step up because they've been on record. Um, they're, they're on video and they're and they're recorded uh, in the meeting notes. But the other the other comment periods where the agencies are soliciting comment and then there's no closing the loop to say we received this or um, or publishing. But yes, it, it would potentially. Um, include that and that that's an example of where that that's a good practice where those comments are published yes i um i was listening to another ssap meeting um a few months ago and somebody during their public comment period said i don't know why i'm providing public comment you guys aren't going to do anything with it flat out that's that's how blunt he was um and all the chair did could do was Thank you for your comment. We understand you, your thoughts. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on my perspective. It just it's part of the relationship building. It'd be a lot easier for me to accept this if there was some sort of screen of the ridiculous comments or the, the comments that don't deserve justification or that. And I I know there's quite a few of them. DOE is an authoritarian agency. They, they, they run by their budget, they run by the Congress. I mean, there's only so much they can do. And yeah, you want them to spend a lot more time answering no impact comments. Lindsay, if DOE responded to comments, would those have to go to Washington for approval? I don't believe so. So a lot of the, and I'm not the PI person, right? I'm not Jennifer Colburn, but they work to what is agreed upon in either the public involvement plan or Rick Brown and Circle. A lot of the requirements to respond to public comment are outlined in those documents. Right. Not not the documents that Tom referred to where where they list the public comments at the end of the documents, some of the surplus, some of the record documents, but just the public meetings, say like the uh, the public meeting on budget briefing uh, that's given to the public. Yes. 
comments were given to DOE, or when comments were given to DOE, whether they're verbal at the meeting or, or written afterwards, but those type of comments have to go to Washington. I don't believe so. Not the ones that are mandated by, by Rick or CERPA. And are you asking the comments or responsive comments? Well, to, even to publish the comments, responses to comments is a whole other right. issue. And I think that in order to provide the best information, it would be beneficial to have Jennifer Colburn here or even Deanna to re respond to some of these questions just because I simply don't know the answer. Uh, Brian, do you have any information that you can um, share? I mean, like I said, I don't want to speak to DV, but it's I, I think I agree with Lindsay that from my knowledge, there's not a requirement for DOE to um, run their response to comments by headquarters, uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, that being said, I think there's some bigger comment period stuff that either they might consult with. Again, this is all just Ryan hypothesizing at this point, but uh, for example, I'd have hazard a guess and say that when we do our response to comments for host negotiations, we're going to probably run that by some different folks before it gets published. Uh, just, just a wild guess. Um, but uh, I, I think that it, it, Lindsay's right that there's not like a requirement for a response to comments like locally to get like headquarters approval, like like a half presentation would. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, and that's why I'm asking. If they have to get approval for half presentations, but they have to get approval for comments. Yeah, I don't think so. Maybe that's something that that Lindsay might be able to get some follow up from Jen on and share with the IAM team if the IAM team meets again, or at the August meeting since this the next full board meeting where the advice will be passed in September. Maybe that could be a follow up. Make sure we have you know Jen in the room to talk to the DOE PI side of things. And, and to be clear, the the advice is intended for formal comment periods by the TPA agencies that fall outside of the required response rubric. So. Um, th there are periodic formal comment periods on the five-year placemat, the 10-year vision, cleanup priorities, and the life cycle, for instance. Yeah, the, things like that. That the are important, and you know, Brian Vance consistently says that that's the most important comment that the have and the public can provide is on the cleanup priorities. But it would be good to see what everyone else in the public is saying. And yes. There are going to be some nonsensical responses. I think if that's a decision to be made by the agency, whether it is in scope or out of scope, but if it's related to Hanford, I think I would I would always err on the side of, of publishing it. Um, if it's you know we we're running a comic period right now, and we're getting a whole bunch of really random ads that somehow they're making their way through the robotic check to make comment that has nothing to do with anything. Um, so I wouldn't exclude, I would exclude those. But if it's hamper related and someone felt it, it was important to say, then that's a valid comment to them, right? I'm not saying the DOE needs to respond to it. And maybe this would be um, a little easier if we, if we sit in the last sentence instead of, um, if we publish all comments received Maybe we don't ask for a response for everything, but at least just publishing them to see how engaged everyone is. Because I don't know how many letters you're going to. I think you need to still, if you're going to publish them, you need to have a response. The response can be as simple as thank you for your comment. We reviewed it and we see you. Yeah. It's, but it's got to be some recognition because that's the goal of this advice is to. Well, we also to realize that you we may not be able to make any kind of commitment type response right. but because they, they may not know what funding is going to be or anything like that. Then it's the this is embargoed due to uh, by headquarters, yada yada yada. There is still a response. But we appreciate your engagement. But we and, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, well, okay. So the holistic negotiations is a prime example. What four years? of saying we can't talk about it, we can't talk about it. I've looked at it now, and they could have talked about some of it. They could have said that we're looking at restructuring what our original agreement was in certain areas. They could have said that, but they're not. It's embargoed. Embargoed. So, and if something's embargoed, then it just gets people's hackles out. Right. And and do you, do you want that? 
outcome out of something like that uh, because it's not a lot condemned. So, but there wasn't a formal comment period on the holistic negotiations until now. And those comments received for the ones now are under the TPA have a response requirement. And consent decree. And consent decree, sorry. Um, so that's a different beast. The, the cleanup priorities is one that they're not going to be able to respond substantively to um, every comment. But they can say, thank you, we will uh, take this into consideration when we're working on our priorities for the budget. And it looks like Dana has jumped online. Dana, were you able to hear um, the majority of this conversation? No, I wasn't, but if you could sum it up, I'd be happy to comment. I apologize. Um, so, Dana, what we're what this advice is talking about is when um, the TP agencies go out of their way to hold a public comment period, which is awesome, and we really appreciate that, um, when there isn't a requirement to do so. Um, what we're asking for would be um, the, those comments received in those formal comment periods that don't have a requirement to respond uh, would be have those comments published and some form of response. Um, whether that's thank you for the comment, we'll take it into consideration, or whether it's a detailed line by line response. Um, just to, um, it was really Ryan's uh, survey or ecology survey that prompted this idea because seeing more than 50% of people responding that they don't feel that their comments make a difference um, means that there's a disconnect between the energy of people commenting and the, the idea of a comment period. So I'm not sure what, uh, how much, uh, how much clearance you would have to get from headquarters to publish comments received, um, with or without a response. Just um, how much effort that is, especially when they're not required. Yeah. Uh, okay. So example, we've got. Brown, can Dana, can Dana okay. Reply? Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh no, I I appreciate all of this. So thank you for repeating and bringing me up to speed. I think we are all passionate about going above and beyond with public involvement because it's something we all care about. And I genuinely appreciate every person who comes to a meeting, participates on the HAB and submits a comment. I believe it would have a chilling effect if the comments to anything that's not legally required have to be published and have to have a response to comment document because all of that takes time and money. And the minute something because becomes time consuming, costly, and might even be something that could be used against you in court, there's going to be a big spiraling down of desire to do the things that are not legally required. So that's why I'd strongly re uh, recommend against that, as I just don't see what value the agencies really get out of it. It's not legally required, and we might lose the meetings that we have that are above and beyond. And, and that, to be clear, we're not talking about public meetings. We're talking about when, when there's a formal public comment period that is held. Yes, yes, I, yes. I do understand that. Um, yeah, that's an interesting take. Um, yeah, it's no small thing to produce a response to comments document. And I was going to add to that that. The, the clerk in charge of receiving the comments is going to have to farm those out to different people, find different SMEs to go answer that. Uh, I, I, we've lived with Lindsay's difficulty in trying to get SMEs to commit the time to do even present to us. Think about that with 100 comments. Or yes, and there. Comments. There, there is a difference between receiving the comments and having a large number of staff read those comments and send those up to headquarters so they're read and factored into decisions. But again, binning, writing, producing, and posting out a response to comment document, that's a tall order. It's costly and time consuming. Dana, did you just imply that all comments are sent to headquarters first? No. In some cases, once the comments are collected, they're sent up to headquarters for consideration for planning purposes, but not all. But not for approval to publish them. Oh, no, no, no. I was, uh, for example, I was talking about the comments for the five-year plan. 
We receive comments for the five-year plan. People need to think ahead and plan. A large number of people will read and pour over and carefully consider all the comments. And then those comments are compiled once the comment period is concluded and sent to headquarters. And those folks will pour over the comments and factor that into decision making, all without any kind of publication or uh, issuing of a response to comments document. Maybe, and, and this is getting sideways on the, on the advice of Brenos, but maybe that statement, um, along with we received uh, 3,000 individual comments and it's being compiled and sent to headquarters for review and for, you know, that alone could be a response to comment, right? It's not, doesn't need to be line by line particularly, um, but just acknowledging that it's not going into the round bin. Uh, that's that's great, and I believe on our Hanford five-year plan webpage it says that. I think that's in all, each time we've done this uh, more elaborate five-year plan comment period, I think we've um, that's been stated in the materials. And I agree with you. It's uh, helpful. Okay. So with that information, what do you think? What would you like to do with this draft advice? It sounds like maybe we should schedule a meeting with PIOs and the IO team if they're available to talk through the potential ramifications or um, alternate wording that could not have a chilling effect on holding public comment periods, but also reinforce the value added by public comment periods that are required. I'm happy to get our staff together to answer any clarifying questions. I just want to be careful that whatever conversation we have, that the agencies aren't like right. influencing it by so to speak. We, so we, that's we, I want to be mindful of. The IM team will be asking questions, not asking for advice on the advice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Th thank you for, for jumping on and uh, being on the spot, Dan. I think our comments are very important. They're part of our values. Listen to the public. Understand. If we could have a way to show that we're receiving those comments and not necessarily addressing each one, um, you know, that may be a halfway between. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to want, you know, for example, you know, retrieving waste from 22 tanks. Well, what if somebody writes a comment and it says, no, we want 13 tanks or we want 25 tanks. OK, so what's going to have to happen for them to resolve that question? You just can't say no. Right. Well, I mean, that's, that's that's a chilling effect. If you say no, it's going to go to 22 because that's what we agreed. On. That one is going to have to have a response because it's part of the TPA. <laughs> so that's I, different than what we're talking about. <laughs> well, make sure but, we're not, not but, but I was just using an example yeah. of, of, of an item. The fire station. Clean up say, area. Oh, I don't like the fire station moving out to the 200 East area. So, can you explain to me, you know, <laughs> how long would it take somebody to answer those questions? And, and um, you know, yeah. uh, I, I don't think we need to waste DOE's time on unnecessary demonstration that they're listening to us because we know they're listening to us. Well, the, the concern is if more than 50% of the people feel like their comments aren't being heard or influencing or being uh, the wording of the question, I, I have your ear. Uh, no, no influence on Hanford decisions. People will stop commenting and people stop being engaged. And then the whole public outreach falls flat. And so there's a balance there between um, crickets and a full novel responding to every comment. So maybe we'll we'll see if we can find that balance um, and come back in August. I think is where that should be. Um, okay. Sounds at four and a call before August or yes. And probably kind of brainstorm. What the call will be and to get a little off line. Global vacation time is going to be involved. Including the PIOs if they're willing and, and able to come. 
Let's be clear on my part. I don't disagree with the advice at all. I just wanted to make sure that they didn't have to go to Washington and spend seven months going through 11 different bureaus before or could get a response or be published. Right. And, and we that's all to, I was asking. And we don't want to write advice that stops public comment periods from happening. So that we got to find that balance um, just to make sure we don't have unforeseen circumstances or ramifications. And it looks like Dana has her hand up to have something. Go ahead, Dana. I just wanted to thank you for um, being able to be included. And may I share my screen and show a little something to you from the five-year plan? Absolutely. Is that all right, Lindsay and Josh? Yes, of course, Anna. Thank you. And you can tell me when you can see it. Yeah. And uh, so if you'll see here under the meeting recording, it talks about um, each year the comments from the five year plan are incorporated into the um, strategic vision, which is a 10 year overview. And so it makes a little mention there about how the comments are collected, they're read, they're read here at the site, then they go to headquarters, and then that goes in. And we found this to be very helpful as far as um, preparing everyone to get ready for the cleanup priorities comment period in the spring. So I think these comment periods that are above and beyond have been valuable to everyone. And so, and the other thing I uh, wanted to say was um, on surveys, when they're broad and folks say, well, my, my comments don't make a difference, I can really empathize with that because there are times when I've stopped what I was doing. We all have families and busy lives and jobs, and I've taken my time to go to a public meeting or submitted a comment, and I might not have received the outcome I wanted. I think back to when we had a big snow year and there were options out there about what they were going to do about um, my kids in high school and making up the time. And what they ended up doing was not um, what I had submitted or wanted, so I can really relate to those feelings. But on the other hand, um, my, my highest priority is wanting to make sure that we continue to be able to have these voluntary things without a lot of rigor and expense, which might just really um, wreck them or stop them. So that would be my, my first order of business and my concern with this. So I, I definitely see both sides of it. Also, we receive some very technical comments. We receive broad comments. We see some that are very tailored to the uh, comment period topics, others that um, are not. And we just can't please everyone. So, and sometimes folks have things that are maybe large and unaffordable within our budget. And sometimes folks have very uh, unique thoughts. I think uh, we've shared the example one time when folks say, we ought to put all this waste in a rocket and send it up into the atmosphere and let it all burn up. And so that probably won't happen, but there's a possibility that um, that person might have fallen into this category where they feel like their advice isn't heard. And so um, I'm not sure if a response to comments document is going to make people feel heard. So I think it's a really noble idea of what you're going for there. But I think of me thinking about my kids at a school board meeting, the person who's submitted the, the legitimate comment that the waste should be sent into the atmosphere. I, will those folks be able to be satisfied? I, I just don't know if that's achievable. Yeah. Did Elon Musk submit that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would so, never share who, who sent what comment. So I would so, never do so, that. So maybe, maybe, you know, obviously we'll, we'll talk about this more. But maybe in this case, um, you could say at the end of that sentence in the five-year plan, last year we received X number of comments and incorporated those into this year's plan. You know, that type of thing, just showing, closing the loop on maybe even just the number of comments received to show that it's tracked. But um, definitely appreciate that, and we'll work with Lindsay to try to schedule time uh, to get the maximum participation and have all of our questions uh, answered. I'm um, taking all that again. Say that again one more time. I'm writing it down. Last year we received. Last year we received uh, this many, 17,203 comments um, on the five-year plan. Um, and it, all of those comments were 
reviewed and uh, considered as appropriate or whatever. Something like that, just to acknowledge um, that the engagement is circular and moving forward. I like what you said that they might be incorporated in next year's planning. There. That's it. Right. Okay. Um, we're we're going to move on to the second part of the IM team with three parts. Um, and uh, I asked Mia if she's willing to just chat about like, the number of comments, the number of uh, advices, or whatever that um, you compiled for your list. Yeah, I can, I can talk to it a little bit. So this came out of the cleanup priorities advice. We had a point um, in there that said regularly schedule opportunities for the TPA agencies to provide education and meaningfully engage in dialogue with the public. And so from that, we thought of um, we formed an IM team to address that point specifically and to look back at past advice and see um, kind of read through everything related to this topic of um, meaningfully engaging with the public and public involvement and see if there's anything that hasn't been said by the HAB that we could say today um, in new advice. And so it's a long list. I don't know how many, there's a very long list of advice um, that has been written by, um, by the HAB in the past. Um, so, so we're working on reading through all of that advice and um, we'll discuss it, I believe in June um, and see if there's, um, if there's any need for writing new advice or if, um, what's been said uh, still stands and there's no need. Um, so that's kind of where we are currently. And if you want that list, um, yes. <laughs> Ian's willing to send it to you um, so you can you know, have some light reading if you need to go to sleep. Uh, all right. And the third part of the IM team of three parts is the discussion that I'm hoping we'll be able to have today um, in the time we have left in this topic, which is how are we doing? <laughs> we're ahead of schedule. We're ahead of schedule. We have plenty of time to talk. Um, so the other part uh, of doing outreach and engagement is education. And the HAB has had a lot of really good presentations on very uh, entry level um, presentations on really complex topics. Uh, and now that we're recording every HAB meeting, um, we have the ability to, you know, take a snip of the YouTube video and break it apart and say, here's a great 101 on CERCLA. Um, and we can have, my, my original thought would be a YouTube uh, have university channel or uh, Hanford University channel. Um, there's questions about who would curate that and who would be able to host it and all that. So um, that's one idea. Another would just be a you know, sort of like uh, a list of a curated list of links to videos with a little summary of what they're about. Um, and then the third piece of, of that would be if we think there's a 101 missing, we could ask the TP agencies um, to you know consider having an SME do a 15, 20 minute uh, webcast of, on that 101 as opposed to doing it necessarily at a full board meeting. Um, and just have this list of sort of education on entry level items that are confusing to people. And we've had, you know, uh, John Price has done some great talks on uh, on RECRA and on the tri-party agreement. And, you know, we can still see John Price present to the HAB and to have members, even though he's moved on to other uh, positions. So that's sort of the conversation that I'm hoping you guys can help with here is, is that an advice point? Is that a discussion? Um, how, how would the COE be interested in curating a list for training or um, brainstorm ideas of how to make this happen? So Josh, when you post the YouTube videos, it outlines like where specific topics start and stop, correct? Yeah, I, I go through and find timestamps as to figure out how they align with the agenda. Okay, so then are you asking to clip those from those and have a separate page? 
or can folks, can we just send folks back to the, I guess the HAG website where it outlines the meeting that has the agenda topics and the briefing, and then they can so, follow accordingly. Yeah, if we did a list of links, for instance, I would say, um, we would say, we would make the link go to the timestamp in question. Okay. And say, here's a entry level presentation given on this date by this person on record. Um, okay. And defining and you know giving a, a baseline understanding of what the resource. That's and have a link to where the, where that presentation is on the on the HAB website. To the YouTube video, to the goes directly to the start of the, of the PowerPoint presentation on the YouTube video. Um, you know, that way you're not having to go in and manipulate the video and pull out this 30 minutes and make it its own video. Well, all the presentations are given on the HAB website. Yeah, so you could also you could also attach the slides. Just link to those. You could also you have to go through YouTube. You can just go directly to the web. So the HAB website. The slide decks are on the website, up. but there's value in seeing an expert present. But there's also links to the YouTube videos on the HAB website. Yes. So, so, but what you're asking for is a separate page which outlines essentially what that Hanford University would look like. Now, um, there is the caveat that we aren't able to link to, I guess, other websites. Does that make sense? Like, so we're not able to link to a briefing from another entity. Right. We or or we could have an unofficial um, disclaimer saying other resources you might want to review. We have a reading list. That's different. From what I was told, it, I mean, we can't link to something presented, like utilizing, I guess, the federal website. We're not able to okay. link to something um, such as a briefing from another organization. Okay. So and I think it's a slippery slope where does that stop? So that wouldn't be able to be hosted on the HABS website then? Correct. But the document can still exist, just not on the HABS website. What document? So if we made a, uh, a list of links. I could ask that. Yeah, that, that doesn't isn't housed. Maybe if we flesh out some uh, subjects that you were talking about, right? And and realize this is a much smaller scope than than what we're going to be envisioning at this point. Yeah. But um, you know, uh, back before when we were coming up with the orientations, when we were trying to set orientations, uh, I had like seven. I, I came up with over seven different subjects that I thought was critical that somebody needs to has to know if they're going to be on the board. And uh, and it's not true. <laughs> it's not true because some of them are, are like radiation 101. You know, I think that's an important thing. I think that a lot of confusion would go away if people understood radiation and what it does and what it can do and what it won't do. And um, but but I have no takers. On you know, and and you go to Hammer, he's got an ex excellent intro to their workers out there on radiation. And, and and so there are a lot of resources out there for those kind of things. I, I, if we flush out those ideas that you want to present, RECRA, CERCLA, um, what, what other things? Well, I mean, those, those seven things that you're thinking are important to you, you know, let's put those on a, a a resource list that someone who may not know that it's important to you or why it's important because they have different priorities can go and, and just take a look. And you were saying Hammer is not allowed. Not, oh. not Hammer. Okay, so good. I was like, what? Hammer? We're trying to get your Hammer tour. <laughs> it's a massive tour. No, what I was saying was if you take a look at the, I guess they have website or maybe that would be a good place to start. Take a look at the have website, see what's there. See what is missing, mm -hmm. and then make those recommendations for improvement on what you know. If maybe things could be, I guess, put together in a different way that would be more beneficial. Like maybe there would be an opportunity to like post all of the photos in one section, and you know the tutorials in another. Just I think that's a great place to start because that's what I was told that could be done. We could make some additions to the Hanford Advisory Board website if. You know, there were substantial things missing. What is it that's missing? What can we add? And is it something that could be supported by yeah. a DACA website? Well, okay. one of the problems going to the HAB website is all the presentations are given under a board meeting. Mm -hmm. You have to look up a specific 
board meeting or a specific committee meeting, mm -hmm. and then you can see what presentations were given. But you won't know where a pre given presentation is on a topic without going through all of those. And that's the goal of the resource list is to yeah, not have to somehow so is there a know in advance where to go. Organize it, yeah. Like you were saying, that's the purpose of the conversation. Right. So I guess part of it is trying to figure out how to organize it. And the other part is to figure out what it is. So the seven things you think are important, those should definitely be on, on the list for 101s. Um, anything else anyone has had a question on in any of the meetings they've been to and you know had to puzzle and, and search for the answer, let's get... So sort of a, a baseline training library. <laughs> yeah, so, I, 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 I would agree that that we think that we need to inform people and, and, and it's good things. Um, what what I really hate is the the you know, title of this book, Dangerous Place in the World. I mean, it's absolutely not true. Okay, we have some of the healthiest worker stats you can imagine. Nobody's getting killed out there at the site. And yet, when we built the McNary Dam down there, you know, 23 guys lost their lives building that dam. Okay, we haven't lost a life out here for, well, a couple trailer accidents for contractors coming on site. But other than that, it's just not happening. And, and it's not, we were very careful what we're doing. Yeah, so yeah, I, I just uh, want to make sure that we get the right ideas across if yeah. we're going to do it. Absolutely, it needs to be curated, right? And it needs to be as impartial and sterile. Not not sterile necessarily, but not spun as much as we can, right? Yeah. I don't, uh, you mentioned Hammer has a 101. Oh, Hammer, yeah. All work, pretty much all Hanford workers have to go in and take their beginning classes at Hammer. Is that a webinar or is that a class of the person? Those are taught by experienced workers at the site. And, and of course, soon they break up to the different crafts. Okay, so you have the general and, and that, and then the crafts. And then, um, but, you know, it, there are a lot of those. That, so, yeah, most well, universities actually have, with the reactor, have a radiation 101. Yeah. It's, um, that's true, but we wouldn't be able to post those because they're not DOE products. And isn't Hammer affiliated with DOE? Well, maybe, maybe not, yeah. but it, it's a textbook. Okay. <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. So once we know what that, it sounds like this is an idea that people are interested in pursuing a little bit further. Once we have the sort of layout and the topics that might fit on it, then the hard part happens and we have to actually curate it um, and keep it up to date over time. And I don't know if that falls on the, the, the shoulders of whoever is on the orientation IMT of every year or whether it's just part of, I don't want to add to this committee's plate, but maybe that's, since it's a sort of an outreach and training thing, maybe the, just who keeps up on the list because we all eventually are going to turn off the board and yeah, so the stuff we find important or relevant. Someone there might be a, a talk in five years from now that blows John Price's talk out of the water, and if we really want to, you know, make that on the list, I can't imagine that would happen. But um, you know, how do we? The other thing to think about is, you know, like how do we build in that periodic update into this list so it's not just sitting on a shelf. Um, but yeah, so. If you have topics that you're interested in, A, seeing if there's a one one out there, and B, um, think that it's important to uh, have a one one out there, let us know and, and we'll try to organize it for the IMT three parts. Or if it's generating of interest, we could ask them to the participants on the IMT. Absolutely. <laughs> um, the more the merrier. And if you're willing to volunteer to give a one on one, um, perhaps that's something we could build into a committee meeting and have sort of well, have members sharing their expertise in an open forum setting, unofficially or not sanctioned by DOE or uh, officially reviewed. Not presenting on behalf of DOE. 
that too is a slippery slope. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. I so, so we have to run that by uh, obviously our, our uh, DDA phone. We have technical <laughs> SMEs come in to do the technical briefings, and we need to keep it uh, at the level. If the like, if you wanted to come in and provide a briefing um, or some information on ODOE or you know mm -hmm. another organization would like to do that, that would be something a little bit different. But as it pertains to work on site, we'll leave that to the department, the regulators, and the contractors. Okay. <clears throat> so, and so everyone's invited to find new ideas to Tom. Let Tom or I know if you want to join the IM team, and you'll be coming every time for a new call sometime in the future. Yeah, we have one in June. Yeah, it's for the. I mean, we we just keep the three hundred. Yeah, we are we're just, just keep it all going. So, <laughs> um, so maybe we'll uh, we'll regroup as an IM team in June, and then maybe try to set something. If we have specific questions for SMEs, um, we can provide those to you, Lindsay and Roy and Roberto, um, and then try to schedule something. Dare I say, in July? Okay. And we don't have anything scheduled this time team in June. We have two other IM teams scheduled. So you have to let me know. I think the it's the um, book report, the 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 other one of the three parts. I thought we had an IT IM team scheduled for that. Okay. Or we were going to. All right. So we'll 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 run back to ground. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have a path forward. We're in danger of being on time. Are we ready to move to committee business? Sure. Um First topic of discussion is the chair vice chair election revisit. And I have to admit, I wasn't at the last meeting, so I'm not sure where we are on that. So if someone wants to recap, that'd be great. We have an interesting situation. We have a nomination for chair and a nomination for vice chair. Neither of those people could be present today. Okay. <laughs> so I suppose the first question would be, are there any other nominations in the room or online? You want to communicate who the recommendations okay. are? All right. So now that we have confirmed we have all the nominations we're going to have, uh, the chair nomination is Amber Walder. She had a previous engagement in Washington, D.C. today. Didn't be here. Um, and in general, she will require these meetings to be on Monday or Wednesday due to her Spokane County Commissioner duties. And for Vice Chair Michelle Holt, has confirmed she's willing to continue in that role. Are there any any thoughts? I say we nominate and, and vote on Mich um, Amber for chair and Michelle for vice. Beginning October first. Beginning October first. They were in support of Amber Waldrop serving as CUE chair starting October first. Yes, this is only for members of the committee, right? We're all members. You can, I mean, only members, members of the committee can vote. Everybody's, Everybody's a member of COVID. Everybody can be members of the COVID, but you have to say that you want to be a member to be a member. Oh. <laughs> I declare I want to be a member of COVID. Yes. Any day above. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Not hearing any, any objections? All right. Walter has been elected as co-chair unanimously. Okay. And um, so for vice chair, we have one nomination of Michelle Holt. Does everyone support of Michelle Holt continuing to serve as vice chair? Yes. Well, that's unanimous election. Great. Congratulations. If you see them or hear from them, please extend your congratulations. Next, we have the draft work plan review and input. I don't know if you all have that in front of you. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Screen is what's been identified for CUE for the next fiscal year. Um, tomorrow, we'll be going through this in great detail, potentially making it into edits. So, 
is an opportunity to our committee chair or designate with any information you want brought forward. So I know on last year's work plan, um, the risk communication and strategies was joint with CARM. I don't know if we want to list it in both places on this year's work plan, um, but we still haven't had that briefing. You're still working on that one? We or whatever it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, we can put it back on there and under the DOE. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I feel like the... Um, the PJ item needs a little clarification. I, I'm confused by what it is. I see the other two. Yeah. yeah, there's a few different components there. I think what we talked about last year when this was first brought up was just in general, ecology, US DOE, and US EPA all have different environmental justice kind of uh, uh, policies or, um, you know, Estimations or initiatives or whatever the heck you want to call them. Like we have the Heal Act and there's Justice 40 or a bunch of other stuff. So I think that's one of the initial ideas behind this was was you know potential advice around you know how the agencies can kind of unite our EJ policies and kind of play them together nicely. And, you know, whether that's talking about actual EJ work or communications and public involvement. So I think that's one piece of it. Um, and then as I've shared at several uh how community meetings, specifically ecology, is interested in advice from the board on um, advice on our community engagement plan that we're going to be developing that's required under the HEAL Act. And so we're still on track for the agency to develop its community engagement plan by, I think, the end of this year, early next year. And then and then we're going to take it and develop you know, a nuclear waste program kind of version of it. And obviously, advice for that big year towards the other agencies too. But, um, so that that was a more specific request I'd had at the board that I've been trying to to work with you guys on over the last year. But so I think there are a couple different kind of pronged approaches there. Um, that's helpful. Yeah, that that makes sense. So not necessarily asking the have to create a have values of environmental justice. It's uh, specific to ecology's plan and. DOE's plan, how do we see Hanford fitting into it? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I mean, I think it could take a few different avenues. It could, it could you know, the have to very well have its own EJ values that it conveys the agencies. It could also be like, so I think specifically what I'm seeking for ecology is, is uh, especially my new position that's going to be filled, uh, that they're going to take lead on developing the nuclear waste program community engagement plan. And, and so I think what we're really interested in is it would be feedback on the plan that's geared specifically towards Hanford and and kind of nuclear side of things. Um, and so we've shared the, the we did the general heal act presentation to the committee back in March, I think. And um, and I think when we get closer to the community engagement plan being done by ecology, we'll have Probably have Courtney headquarters come back and present on the overall agency plan, and then, and then from there, that might be an appropriate place to to actually start developing advice on, you know, just any specific recommendations or advice the board has on what ecology should include in its community engagement plan. Um, that's one idea I had, but I, that's just a suggestion too. The board obviously does it, can decide what how they kind of want to maybe pursue the advice, but that's my recommendation on what I'm specifically interested for in my team on getting feedback on. Um, and there's something I'm missing too, by all means. I'd love to get advice on something I'm missing too. Yeah, that's helpful. It's just when, when the agencies are asking for advice, I want to make sure we understand what that advice is. So maybe some sub bullets. Um, and this is, I, don't, I hate to interrupt, this is very much a request from ecology. Yeah. So the department wasn't looking for anything uh, for this topic. Yeah, good clarity. Okay. So yeah, maybe, maybe that's a good sub bullet. Maybe mm -hmm. instead of unification of diverse environmental justice directed initiative, we could say, uh, sub bullet ecology um, outreach engagement plan uh, okay. review. Yeah, I think you're. I think over the last year, this this has evolved a bit. I think this is the same point that was on last year's. So yeah, it's it's evolved a little bit more. So I I think that can make sense. I can work with things. Yeah, giving a sub bullet. Well, the whole EJ concept is 
constantly evolving and, That's and our understanding of environmental justice and definition of environmental justice is, is evolving as it should because we're thinking about things. Absolutely. And it will continue to evolve. Too. And one thing that you'll see on the work plan that's a little bit different than last year is instead of just um, informational or advice, we also added the term action. And so there's times where we're asking for an action from the hab that may come forward as, you know, a briefing to one another on um, you know, recruiting and retaining candidates for the hab or developing a strategy to promote the hab to the community. That may be more like a roundtable discussion. It could be a white paper. It could be advice if you feel like it is necessary. But there's no um, specific request for what that will look like. And so that's why we wanted to kind of keep it open. Um, if you had one group wanted to fill in towards. Yeah, I think that's an addition that we liked having in there too, because this is uh, Stephanie shared and David shared before he left that, and I've shared that we get a lot of the other board too, not just out of the advice, but out of the conversations, feedback that we hear. So I, I think I, I personally, I like the addition of that action there. That way, you know, maybe it's not advice, but maybe it's a white paper around tablers. It ensures that all IM teams don't have to come out with advice. They can just do the work and report out. And mm -hmm. Like the, the orientation IM team never writes advice on orientation. It's just we help so, make the package. Yeah, there's that added value there. Yeah. Yeah, that clarification is like thing with. So experience I had <clears throat> have had this last year with the city of Pasco is, uh, of course, there's the new mayor, you know, every so often, and there's a new city manager and assistant city manager, but they have no idea what HAB is all about. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think that would go a long way would be a, a, a letterhead from DOE basically to all of the organizations that have it. So it go to the mayor and the, and the city manager explaining, in, in my case, explaining what the HAB is and why is it important and what the schedule is for nominating new people. Um, you know, they seem real surprised a while ago when I mentioned that I'm going to turn them out. And, and well, what do we do? And, and so um, possibly, uh, I think you could do it in a one or two page letter uh, with the DOE letterhead and maybe the state or maybe a joint letter basically saying, we're inviting you as a member of the tri-party uh, community that um, we, we, we need to recruit new people to be interested in representing you for the Hanford site. And, like I said, they were clueless about the timetables, about the frequency frequency of meetings. Um, some people thought it was just once a year. <laughs> but maybe but, it would be beneficial for the agencies to kind of have maybe like a, a team's meeting with our organizations just outlining those items. I mean, we're sending emails <laughs> with all of this information, but it sounds like it's not always getting to the right folks. Right. And, and I think that would really help and, and people understand that, that they need a little bit more effort into doing that. By the way, when I, I was going to mention it in the next meeting, but I did, um, I generally attend at least two city council meetings a year. And this last May, I attended one and, um, and I read up our values and I give an introduction of the progress of the site and what's going on and how important it is to have um, people from the community involved. Um, but, uh, you know, beyond um, that superficial explanation, they're clueless. And, and I, I don't know how we can expect more community involvement if they don't know about it. And, and I don't know that I'm the only messenger that should be telling all the city of Pasco what the have is. Um, my, my second, which has never shown up. Um, well, if you look on there, develop a strategy to encourage members to recruit and retain candidates for the HAB. So I think that there'll be lots of conversation in the next yeah. fiscal year. Yeah. How often do the TP agencies look over the uh, nominating authority list to confirm that the correct person is on the list for emails? Is it annually? Annually. Mm -hmm. 
And do, do you ask the people who are holding that seat who the nominate who the appropriate email for the nominee authority is, or does it just go to not not necessarily we have a a list of all of our nominating authorities because you you're not the nominating authority for of DOE. So we can right. send it to you, but it would right. but, but I know who that is. Correct. And if we have a new mayor, Rob will be able to tell you the email address for the new mayor. Right. There's lots of yeah, different lots of moving parts and pieces. And so there's you know administrators that are in the loop that help, you know, ping folks and so and each organization has a different structure too, which is also awesome. yeah. Yeah, it's it's not so everybody small. has a merit. Yeah. <laughs> but we are on target for this membership package approval. So yeah. you're doing great. They they were very surprised when I mentioned that it took this long for signatures to go through. Well, that kind of, that kind of elevated me a little bit. You must be important. You go back to Washington, DC. You know? You're feeling fancy, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Ask for a pay raise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two more cents. Any <laughs> thoughts on what this committee should be looking at next year? Well, orientation is one, and member recruitment has got to happen. What, what this committee should have. Um, something about the regional meeting planning. Isn't that the COE that for the head for COE? Did you miss it? Did you miss your head into that process? Typically, the request comes from the ESC. Okay. And then I would work with the ESC. But I think when it comes to like nuances, that could come to this committee. I don't know that it needs to necessarily be on the work plan. It just kind of. Okay. With that being said, I anticipate the request for a regional meeting in 25. On the last bullet here, develop a strategy to encourage members to recruit and retain candidates. Are we having a retention problem? I think it's it's hard in general. I mean, they're to to get participation, right? We the group is meeting pretty frequently for extended period of time, so folks who are still working struggle sometimes to attend some of these meetings. And so sometimes folks drop off or like with Jacob Reynolds, he took a different position and he was no longer eligible. But if we continue to communicate or have our members communicate with others, whether it be, you know, in a non-union, non-management, public at large, and for challenge position, you know, the, the word is out there. Um, but I don't know, Brian, would you say, Retention, pro I mean, we also have folks rolling off every. I think there's an every term. I think there's there's a trifecta of things we're looking at. Like one thing is is the board members that are appointed is getting them to regularly attend and participate and be engaged. There's, uh, as Lindsay said, we have folks that roll off you know, because of term limits, and then the third factor is we do get folks that drop off the board either because they they realize. Um, you know, how big of your time commitment it is, or like if you have a, somebody that comes in a new position, like we had several positions in the last year that had to leave the board because they took new positions, like uh, Jacob Reynolds got new management positions, he wasn't eligible, Esteban moved down to Oregon, he was no longer eligible. So I think we just have a, a multitude of, of kind of factors that play into retention and engagement. And uh, I think that strategy here talks, you know, about, about how can we, how can we mitigate, you know, all of those impacts. Best we can. Well, I think engagement ought to be there. And that's quite a bit different than retention. Yeah, I, I think that's good to include more yeah. than engagement on there. I think that's, that's that's a good point. And one thing we heard, Susan and I heard at the EMSSAB from the other boards, is that what they found is the best way to find new members is you the the member who is terming off or about to leave. Um, kind of recruits that that new member to fill their position, and they're able to communicate, you know, what kind of a time commitment it is, how much value you get out of the board, um, and just the the different relationships and things like that. So um, I think that's a piece of this as well. One thing that might be on here, and I've suggested it several times in, in over the years. Is they had, and this kind of goes along with the library that uh, that that Tom was talking about is to have a mentorship program. 
where new members um, can be assigned people or more informal than that uh, for help. How does DOE work? How does Hanford work? But some kind of some kind of program where a new member who's clueless about Hanford and DOE can go to someone without feeling, you know, funny about it or thinking that they're dumb or anything like that for information and help, or even how the have operates. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think that. Uh, that could be something that the COB could take on. It could be the ESC takes on that recommendation. I think it's a really good idea. And I think it's it's especially important because there are a number of us who are going to rotate off, assuming we're approved for another term, um, in in a couple of years. Me, who have a lot of experience here, Tom, Rob, you, I think, and a couple other people. That that's a lot of experience about Hanford and and the have that's 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 being lost. It would be a shame for new people coming in, like with this new orientation period, not to come to some of us um, before we do rotate off for for basic information. Yeah. Help. I think that's um, just to note that you know a few years ago when the board passed its membership like the term limits advice and, and ecology's response we had said something to the fact that we'd like to see you know some kind of something instituted i can't remember the exact wording but some kind of something instituted to help ensure that we're retaining you know some of the knowledge or it's like you said mentorship stuff so I, at least from that side um that's something we're interested in i think that's reflective of uh why it's on there too the retention and recruitment and, and uh, maybe we could expand that a little bit to include um you know mentoring or something like that because we want to make sure that you know, folks aren't just you know thrown into the deep end of the pool. So. You know, on that on that survey that we're going to talk about tomorrow, that that came out on which I left at home. Um, mentorship would go kind of along with that on on how we get increased participation. Uh, the whole thing we talked about the last board meeting. Or build um, community, right? The survey that we had to answer questions on. Yeah. Ryan Reach called. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? So we surveyed have membership, um, for, like, I can't remember what it was called. The oh, have membership. Yeah, so have membership. Ryan <laughs> Somebody yeah. Said. yeah. <laughs> Ryan, not Ryan. But I think that it would be helpful for new members to feel, I guess, more involved in that have community because there's folks who've been here quite a long time who can have your own little niches and so in your own groups and so a mentorship program would help with that. So maybe how to build a, you know, a more or a better have community, whether that be bowling nights after hours or karaoke, I mean, all the things that I would like to do. Well, maybe in the orientation coming up in October, mm -hmm. people who would like to have the time and like to be mentors or sources of information, maybe their names could be Offered up or, or or given to the to the new members, and maybe a little a little segment of time just to discuss something like that. So could we talk about that at the August meeting? That way it's kind of fresh in folks' mind, and we can get those people on a list and prepare for October. So in my grandson's school, they um, have volunteer kids to go help kids that they say are struggling. Um, and that seems to work. I don't know if the helper squad or I can't remember what the name is. It's got a little badge. Um, you, you know, it's almost a volunteer thing. And and so maybe simply if our our chairman of our board would make an announcement for when the new members show up is that um, you know could anybody raise their hand and want to help with something and and identify people willing to talk to new members about this and do that beginning understanding of how important it is. And you know, I, I do think though in our regular orientation, the discussion of our bylaws is so important because a lot of what we do rotate around that. And you know that's a very technical or a, a sit down type of orientation thing. But um, People raising their hands, willing to help somebody is unclear. Volunteering would be more of a. It, it'd probably be easier for people to ask as well. 
I like adding it to the co agenda for August um, and kind of curating a list of people and having that ready to go um, instead of on the fly at orientation, mm -hmm. like at having people raise their hands because then it, it seems more intentional mm -hmm. um, and people would hopefully feel more comfortable reaching out um, if they're kind of given a list of things. Okay. We have you know, three items in this committee business that all have kind of started overlapping. <laughs> I suppose to start off with, do we, are we confident we have discussed everything we need to ahead of the leadership workshop for a code's word plan? I like it. All right. Um, the next part was an environmental justice advice request check in, which Ryan sort of gave a background <laughs> as to what we're looking for. Um, the last meeting in March, we had it, this may had a presentation of it, the OAC as it's staying prepared at the state level. What do you see as the next step in the timeline? Yeah, that's a good question. I think what we talked about back in March was uh, potentially having. So a few years ago, we had a committee of the whole or half the day was kind of focused on EJ where we had presentations for all three agencies. And then obviously we have a lot of, um, you know, board rotation since then. So part of the reason why we did the HELOC overview was to introduce environmental justice again this year, specifically to our advice request and then to uh, uh, just have the, the kind of one on one topics. So I think a few ideas I heard back in March was uh, having DOE come and do an EJ presentation or EPA kind of do a uh, EJ presentation to uh, the COE committee. So that might, I still think that might be a good idea, especially, you know, even if the advice is focused specifically to ecology, it'd still be really good, I think, for the committee to have an understanding of what the other, other initiatives are, because you could, you know, uh, say, hey, ecology, look at what EPA and DOE is doing, or here's some specific things that they're doing that we think you should include in your community engagement plan. So I, I think, you know, having DOE come or EPA come to also do a bit of overview would be a good idea that we just, that we discussed before. Uh, Lindsay, I can't remember, uh, and I'm not sure it's the same person, but there was a really good presenter that came from headquarters a few mm -hmm. years ago, I think. Yeah. So maybe we could have her or somebody from the local office do an EJ presentation at some point in the future, or EPA too. So I think that's one idea for maybe the next step. Um, and as I shared before, um, the ecology agency-wide community engagement plan, we currently have um, a provisional plan that we're working off of to, to meet the deadline, but we're going to have the ecology-specific one that they're still working on finalizing, which uh, I've been in, uh, in contact with our, our our environmental justice office, and it sounds like they're still on track to get that done. I think by the end of this calendar year, or early next year. Um, so whenever that the, uh, the official ecology uh, community engagement plan is done, I'd like to bring that that gal back from headquarters to do a, a presentation specifically on that community engagement plan. So, but again, I don't, I don't foresee that happening until towards the end of this year, early next year. But I think there's still a few steps that could be done between here and now, including. Uh, DOE and EPA talking about, you know, some of their EJ stuff might be a good start to continue that kind of one-on-one and understanding before we kind of get to the meaty topic of the community engagement plan. But that's just my recommendation for next step. But um, I just wanted to to check in on it since that's a request I was I was kind of passionate about for for advice. So I'll make sure that we get some good input on on that plan when it comes time for my office to make our plan. You know what I'd like to see with also talking about environmental justice is. How does environmental justice relate to a complex cleanup site that's fundamentally governed by RECRA, CERCLA, Atomic Energy Act, Clean Air, and so on and so forth? What's the interaction between the idea of environmental justice concepts and those things that are kind of set down in law that you have to obey in, in an environmental cleanup? <clears throat> that's, that's what I would have some expectation of of understanding going forward. Yeah, cultural historic preservation act too. Right. Well, and I totally go with that because if, if yeah, high in the sky, whatever. If new administration comes in, the term environmental justice is wiped out of existence, as we've all seen politicians can do. Yep. The core concepts of environmental justice that have value to the communities, I believe will probably stay. But what does that mean? You know, it's, it's it, it, again, it's, it's in relationship with all of 
you know, the yeah. core concepts that, yeah. you know, in relation to all the regulatory requirements. Yeah, that's a good point. I think another interesting fact is that you said administrations can change things easily. I mean, I have two federal agencies at Hanford, obviously, we're the state agency, so there could be some impacts there, but I'll, I'll just say from my side, if for some reason EJ were to go away on a grander scale at the federal level, it's not going away at the state level. At least anytime soon, you have that law that was passed and some other stuff. So at least on the state side, EJ's EJ's going to stick around. Um, but like you said, okay. even if even if it goes away at the federal level, there still be some the concepts. Yeah, exactly. I mean it's it's kind of going off on a tangent. DEI, diversity, equity, or diversity, equality, and inclusion have been in existence since the sixties. The term is new. If the term goes away, we're still going to be embracing diversity and and equality and inclusion as HR concepts, because they make sense. So it's the, over the years, the terms change or go away, but the underlying concepts that make sense for good business are what we embrace. And how does that interact with the laws and the Hanford site? Right, exactly. So. I mean, that's a question for the committee then as out of some of, I guess the ideas I had, what what do you guys want to see as a path forward? If you're if you're gonna pursue advice on this, what do you want to, do you like the idea of having EPA and DOE come? Or if you want something else, what would make the most sense for your guys to develop, you know, policy level advice for the next step? Um, given also the timeline that I kind of walked through about where my headquarters is at and I, I think I deferred to the committee on on that next part. I think you're going to get better response if you do a sounding board and advice. Um, once your once ecology has their community engagement plan and you're looking at just your um, offices, you know, bringing ecology's community engagement plan back to the committee and then asking for everyone to just sort of spitball ideas for your new person who's going to be writing your Taylor point might be more beneficial than trying to get consensus on what EJ is across the board. And another aspect of it too, I think, yes, ignoring, I don't know, put aside for a minute, diversity, inclusion, and so on. If you look at where Hanford's going 50 years from now and think about land use, um, is there an aspect of environmental justice that's going to apply to Ultimately, the land use of Hanford, certainly the tribes would, would say yes, um, but beyond the, beyond the tribes, is, is that where environmental justice would really play a, a significant part as the ultimate land use of the site? And that would go into the committee that deals with long term stewardship, land use, and something like that. So I was, you, Ecology recently had a social media post about. Uh, rare plants that only exist in one section of the site. And, you know, that is an environmental justice asset because um, biologic diversity of plants can lead to more resilient ecosystems and more resilient ecosystems leads to natural beauty and wildlife and wildlife is leads to environmental justice. I mean, it's all tied together. So even just planting plants of remediation sites and that kind of thing it could be an environmental justice issue mm -hmm. so keep an eye on the clock um i just wanted to make one more quick point that i'm not seeking advice on what environmental justice is the state has a definition of environmental justice that you know taken from epa but we have uh, some extra stuff added to it so we have our own definition of environmental justice and i'm advice isn't going to change that um so i think i'm specifically interested in like aspects of the community engagement plan you know how do we engage the community with EJ, you know, taking EJ considerations in effect, those sorts of things is what I was kind of getting at. So yeah, I'm not looking for the board to define EJ for us. It's very have that definition. Thanks for that clarification. Good. Yeah. Um, sorry, and I'll defer to Josh and then we're running out of time. So, so we'll, this committee will look again at the Heal Act towards the end of the calendar year. Uh, do we and EJ can look see what perspectives anyone can want to bring for the meeting? Sounds good. For August, so that we won't be looking at Heal Act then. I heard a desire or a suggestion that we may want to look at orientation. I also had an idea of an orientation IM team earlier in the meeting. We were like, wonderful. 
Oh, that's a question. Um, so orientation as a subject for our CUE August meeting, but I also heard the idea of CUE IM team. So potentially, if they form that, they could bring some ideas to the CUE, or we could have that entirely at the CUE meeting. Because <laughs> I was informed, we have a standing orientation team. We typically do anyway. I don't know if urged. Yeah, I think we might. I think we may have decided that need to be reformed with someone to carry it forward. Yeah, I think I think uh, orientation IM team makes sense in that way. The ideas are more mature in August, so they can be presented to a couple months later. Uh, the orientation team last year really came out of the operations group. Right. That was the year before. Year before, the year before. Do we have any initial volunteers for this team? I don't know. I don't know. All right, Rob volunteer. Who else wants to volunteer? Um, Mia. Chris. Susan, you can hand up too? Yep. Susan. Chris. And we. And Chris, are you the lead then? Pardon? Are you the lead then? It's a t shirt with that. Actually, we <laughs> can advertise that and have happenings to potentially get more interest. And are there any other topics this committee would like to focus on for August? The IMT on three parts might be coming back. Okay. That's it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. The meeting's adjourned. I'll see you at one o'clock for the change session.